Aaron Abke is a paradigm shifting spiritual teacher that delivers a fresh new perspective on self realization through his teachings on the law of one, non duality, and spiritual intelligence. Aaron aims to provide humanity with the tools, knowledge, and practices needed to aid our collective ascension to enlightenment or, quote, fourth density, fourth density consciousness. His passion and purpose is to awaken this planet to the awareness of our oneness and collective destiny as an enlightened civilization. Quite the bio. Um, <laughs> man, it's, it's so cool because when I was looking into the law of one in 2018 through 2019 ish, I would come across your videos and watch them. And then now you're one of my best friends, such a just weird turn of events. I was funny how it works. Yeah. It's so weird. I was a groomsman in your wedding and stuff. And yeah, you signed cool. my affidavit. I signed the affidavit for your common law. <laughs> <laughs> you're the reason I'm married, bro. I am the, I am the one, <laughs> I'm the reason. Absolutely not. But yes, I appreciate that. Um, man, I, I I'd like to start because you appeared on the way forward podcast, the previous version of it before this one, um, was rebranded to the way forward. So you've not been on this one. Uh, so l let's start with your, your background and let's start with, I think you growing up in the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Born and raised. I'm a third generation pastor's son and, uh, grew up in the church, kind of evangelical spirit filled denomination. So I was really blessed that I didn't grow up in a super legalistic type of church environment. It was very, we call it spirit filled. You know, we walked in the gifts of the spirit, healing, worshiped like crazy. We'd have these crazy revival services where people would be just dancing, running around the sanctuary while we're worshiping God. And like, we would make these charged environments where like serious miracles would happen. I, I witnessed so many incredible things as a, as a little kid in those church services. And it was just normal to me that, you know, physical healing and all of that. Um, so I so did these were things you directly witnessed. So it wasn't even crazy to you as you eventually learned. Yeah. About it was just like, way. this is, uh, what God does, you know, God yeah. heals people. God does miracles. So it wasn't until I was 23 that I graduated from Oral Roberts university in Tulsa, Oklahoma with a double bachelor's in music and theology to be a full-time worship leader and follow my dad's footsteps. I was a super devout follower of Christ. I had my incongruencies with certain Christian teachings like that what? I, hell, the rapture, biblical yeah. inerrancy, uh, men being superior to women. But I just kept those secret like we all did, you know? And it wasn't until I got a job at 23 as a full-time worship leader right out of college, freshly married, that everything came crashing to a head and I just had to force myself to look at those internal conflicts I had about my religion because the church I got hired at was very much the opposite of my family's church. I never heard my dad teach one sermon on hellfire and damnation and any of that stuff. It was always about the love of God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, forgiveness. But you you church, went to school in Oklahoma. Were you, did, was this church in Oklahoma that you were No, it at? was a church back home in San Jose. Okay, California, it was back in San Jose. Okay. In the Bay Area. And this church was like only talking about who's going to hell, who's in the Jesus club and who's not. And very much believed like men are superior to women. And I could tell you tons of stories about that, that it just, I had no choice, but to accept that I didn't believe what these people believed. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of blew up my life at 23, left my church job, moved back to Oklahoma and just kind of started spiritual seeking all over again. Uh, after going through quite an existential crisis of like, well, I'm not a Christian anymore. Uh, I got divorced at 26. All my Christian friends and family, denounced me as a heretic. So I had to start from scratch at like 26, moved back in with my parents and just started reading whatever texts called to me to try to figure out this supreme question of who is God? What is the universe? What's the meaning of life? I don't know anymore. I thought I knew. And now I'm, I'm not so sure anything I believed was true. So it was through studying Eastern traditions that really uh, re-enlivened my view of Jesus and understood Jesus to be an enlightened being or an avatar, you might say, just like Zoroaster, Krishna, Buddha, and the avatars before him. I think Jesus, in my personal opinion, was is likely the most illuminated being of them all, uh, specifically because of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. That like we have this litmus test of like who's the most enlightened being? Well, to really know, you've got to put every one of them through this trial by fire. 
and see like does your enlightenment stay there through torture and torment and physical death and crucifixion and who knows maybe buddha could have done it maybe krishna and zoroaster could have done it they probably could have but we don't know but we do know that jesus did it right that he maintained his illumin illuminated state never never turned his back on god accepted the entire thing saying nobody takes my life i'm laying it down freely i trust my heavenly father's plan to the point of being crucified and forgiving his murderers while they're murdering him mm -hmm. and nailing him to the cross. That's the picture of Jesus outstretched on the cross that we see in Catholicism that to me has tremendous symbolism that Christians don't like that image. Like, no, oh, he's risen, brother. Yeah. Yes, but like before that, he went through the most brutal torment a person can ever go through and kept the love of God in his heart through the whole thing. Father, mm -hmm. forgive them for they know not what they do while he's on the cross ultimate demonstration of enlightenment. Yeah. So that's what the East Eastern teachings showed me about Jesus that Christianity didn't show me. Christianity just said, oh, he's a special guy, came down from heaven, the only son of God, got murdered on your behalf, just confess him as Lord, you're a worm, you're a sinner, and then you'll hopefully go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's this totally disconnected picture. But when you read like the Gnostic Gospels, the Essene Gospels, they had a very different image of Jesus as being this way shower the demonstration of God consciousness embodied. And that's the Jesus that I follow today. So you were, when you were growing up in the church, you were witnessing these miraculous healings occur. And as you started to become disenfranchised with Christianity and the church as a whole, you were probably having to reconcile the reality that you witnessed very real miracles mm -hmm. occurring, but then you had these fundamental disagreements with some of the things that are taught within Christianity. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to, to not throw all of it away? Or did you at any point throw all of it, cast all of it aside? Yeah, I didn't do that so willingly. It happened in a way just by virtue of, I so reject this religious version of God that I have to question everything that I mm -hmm. once believed. But that was the cognitive dissonance that I, I couldn't reconcile was that, I saw crazy miracles in my church many, many times for many years that I cannot discount. And so it was like, how do I explain that stuff? And for a while, I was like, maybe it's just people getting into these ecstatic states and the mind is powerful and does things. I don't know. But I couldn't deny what I had seen. And so that kept a loop open for me, I think, of there's got to be more to that than what I was told. In church, I was told, you know, we, we beg God to do things please heal us, please help us. And then God, if God's in a good mood, does it or doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. And that was never satisfying as a Christian because it's like I've prayed to God with an absolute contrite heart for certain things that God didn't answer. And it's like, what more, what more do you want, God? Like it says in the Bible, all you want is a broken and contrite heart. Mm -hmm. I brought that to you and I'm not healed. So there was principles that I wasn't understanding that it wasn't until I read the law of one that explains the metaphysics of the energy centers and how these metaphysical events like healing and miracles take place that just gave me incredible clarity on all the things I'd experienced in a way that really validated them um, from a metaphysical point of view, not the Christian point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, Christians, to me, totally misunderstand what healing is, thinking that it's beseeching an outside source for an internal problem. And it's the opposite, right? But I digress. Um, it was, it was the one thing I think that kept my heart in the Jesus story was that I saw miracles that Jesus did in my own church. I saw blind eyes opened. I saw deaf ears opened. I myself as a kid prayed for people with really bad eyesight and had their eyesight totally restored to 2020 vision. And uh, well, the one guy's name was Rudy. He was a former bouncer. He's this really big guy. And he was kind of like one of our church security guards. And uh, he was at every service, like super devout Christian. And he had really bad eyesight, always wore glasses. And I think I was like six or seven and he asked me to pray for him. And I'm this little kid who's seen all these miracles. So I was like, yeah, God, Jesus will heal you. And his eyesight gets restored. And uh, up until the last time I saw him, I think I was in my early twenties, but I would run into him at other churches every so often. And every time he would see me, he didn't have his glasses on and he would say, Hey man, still got that 2020. <laughs> like he would remind me of that every time to like, in a way, like remind me that that miracle really happened when right. I was six or seven. So yeah, like I was just open to the miraculous as a normal part of life. And uh, that came full circle when I read texts like the law of one that kind of explained how it works metaphysically.
When you were reading these texts that you came across, um, looking into more Eastern traditions, was it hard for you to reconcile the reality that what you grew up learning wasn't the full picture, that it was totally untrue? Or, or did you have a feeling of, oh, no, this makes so much more sense. This is what my soul always knew to be true, mm-hmm. and now I'm seeing it verbalized or written out on paper or documents, et cetera? Definitely a little bit of both. There was, like, I always knew, even when I was a Christian kid, like, there's something to this Jesus guy. He's got a thread of, of divine truth that he expresses in a way that I've never seen or felt. When I read those red letters, they captivate me in a way that nothing else does. So I knew that there was more to Jesus than what I was told. And reading Eastern texts, understanding what enlightenment is, was very clear very quickly. Like, oh, that was Jesus. He was an enlightened man who lived in first century Israel and tried to express his enlightenment to a monolithic Judaistic culture that didn't even have language for that. Very dualistic language, deep separation consciousness, like no ability to really understand the oneness message that Jesus was teaching. But what's funny is just uh, a few dozen miles southeast of Jerusalem, there was this sect of Jews called the Essenes who believed in oneness and taught oneness all through their texts. And so, you know, that's one of the things that made me start to go, I wonder if Jesus might have been from that sect of Judaism because he definitely wasn't a Pharisee Mm. and he definitely wasn't a Sadducee. That's all he talked about the whole time. He pointed to how they were doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And when you read the Essene text, that's what the Essenes did too. They said, those people are wicked. They've distorted God's law. Mm. Um, The Essenes actually say that Moses brought down the Ten Commandments from Sinai and they were these, um, it's in the Essene gospel, but they're very metaphysical laws. They're very cosmic oriented laws more based on the heart and mm-hmm. like the, uh, the inner relationship with the divine. And Moses, as the story goes in Exodus, brings down, or Deuteronomy, brings down the Ten Commandments, sees the Jews worshiping a, a golden calf and gets burned with, burns with anger, smashes the tablets, and then pronounces you know curses on the Jews for backsliding and stuff. And then in the Bible, it says he goes back up to the mountain and gets another set of tablets and brings them back down. But the difference with the Essenes version of that story is that he goes back up and basically has this conversation with God and says, please, God, forgive them. They're like little children. They don't know anything. They're worshiping a golden calf. They, they don't have the capacity to understand these holy laws you've given me. And so God says, I understand. I will give them a watered down version of these laws. And so then Moses comes back with what we know as the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Which seem very almost like legalistic doctrinal Mm -hmm. rather than heart-led or embodiment surrounding the the Ten Commandments. Jesus says in the Essene Gospel of Peace, he says, the closer to God a law is, the fewer there are. The farther away a law system is from God, the more laws there are. And so that's what we see in Leviticus, this gigantic book of laws where it's like, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. And it's like living by this rigid dogmatism of like every part of my life is a scripture I'm trying to obey. Well, it's, it's such a flip on, I was thinking as you're saying this the whole time, there's just two different approaches when it comes to spiritual, spirituality, religion Mm -hmm. as a whole. And it's that it's either an outside in process Mm -hmm. or an inside out process. Mm -hmm. And Traditional Christianity, as I saw it and as I grew up in, was an outside in process. I need to seek out there to find the answers for me. And that ends up being that I follow a bunch of doctrine and dogma mm-hmm. surrounding how I'm supposed to be as a human being, where I'm having to almost fit a like square peg into a round hole. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit inside my body. It doesn't resonate within me. And I yeah. don't like using that cliche term, but it really doesn't resonate within my body. Whereas when you you read something that is pointing back to a deeper truth that sort of forces you to have that euphoric internal process that it's like, oh my God, this resonates as true. That's when you know you found something that mm-hmm. it's it's like you have to actually embody it inside out, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Yep. What you're describing is the difference between fundamentalism and mysticism. Yeah. Fundamentalist spirituality is religion which is all about commandments you have to obey. And mysticism is the opposite. It's um, an inner communion with the divine that expresses itself as outward purity and righteousness. So you're very right in that the fundamentalist approaches God from an outside in way of like, if I obey all these laws, I will become inwardly pure. Mm -hmm. And the mystics say, no, no, no. 
become inwardly pure and your outward self will obey all the laws naturally. Mm -hmm. And that's why Jesus said, all the law and prophets are summed up in this one law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And in the Essene gospel of peace, I found this interesting as a law of one, you know, student and teacher that they call it the one law. And they said that the, this is why they kind of condemned the Pharisees and Sadducees, because they said, God gave us one law, the law of one. And the religious fundamentalists splintered it into a, a thousand laws. They broke his law up into all these commandments and have lost their way in scriptures, obsessing over scriptures when the law is written on their heart. And that law is to love God and love your fellow man. And we've lost that way and abandoned that way for the religious fundamentalist way with a million laws when originally we were given just one law. Mm. And that was the Essenes doctrine is return to the one law. We were talking before we clicked record outside and you said that Jesus points, even in the New Testament of the Bible, to the reality that you will not truly find the spirit within the scripture. You mm -hmm. have to find it within. Can you recite that verse? Yeah, it's, I don't know the scripture exactly, but it's the famous passage where he's going toe to toe with the Pharisees as usual. And they're talking about, well, our father Abraham, this and that. And he says, you guys search the scriptures because you think in them you have life, but those scriptures testify of me and you can't even recognize me. Mm. And then he says that as well in the Essene gospel multiple times that scriptures are written by man, not by God. God doesn't write books. God writes his laws in the cosmos itself. Jesus says the word of God is nature itself, right? Nature itself tells you of divine laws. And to the Essenes, it was all about law, mm -hmm. but not written law, divine law, like natural law was, yeah. their, was their way. And in the, they have an Essene gospel of John. And you know how in John chapter one, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, et cetera. In the Essene gospel, it says, in the beginning was the law and the law was with God and the law was God. And then uh, the law became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus. Mm -hmm. They say Jesus was the embodiment of divine law. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. I want to get to this scene. I have one more question on your um, growing up in the church, because this, this is something that I've wrestled with quite a bit. The same things that put you off to religion in modern Christianity are exactly what put me off. Mm -hmm. Hell, uh, the idea, especially as I went to West Point and I had friends of various religions who are some of the most kind, loving people that I know, the idea that because they had been made aware of Christ mm -hmm. and they then, quote, rejected Christ insofar as they did not become Christians themselves and still maintain their old religion, the idea that they were going to hell made absolute zero sense to me. And then for someone, especially many of my friends and really me at the time who, you know, six days a week did not keep the Torah, if you will, and mm -hmm. just behaved however I wanted to, but I still professed that Jesus was my Lord and Savior and I confessed my sins on Sunday and then I was yeah. absolved of everything and I was going to heaven for eternity. That just did not make any sense to me. Yeah. So there's, as I've come to understand it, and I say understand in a very loose way, there's actually very little evidence within, at the very least, the New Testament um, for ideas like hell and the traditional um, uh, Hebrew and, I guess, Hebrew was the original language for... I believe Hebrew was, and then it was copied Aramaic, into Aramaic. Aramaic, yeah. So in the original Hebrew and Aramaic versions of the Bible, they did not teach hell either. So no. it, that's what you've come to understand as well. Oh, dude. Can I, you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. I went deep into this. When See, I, cause, cause this is the thing, right? Cause the, the church teaches it. I'm like, this doesn't sit right. And so the question in my head is like, <laughs> is the church teaching this incorrectly or is this actually what the Bible teaches? And those mm -hmm. are the two questions that yeah. I had to wrestle with. And I've come to the conclusion that the Bible doesn't actually teach that it's a misinterpretation, whether unwittingly or intentionally, I don't know, but it's a misinterpretation of what the Bible says. Dude, it's such a rabbit hole, especially if you're came from a religious background that, you know, we're taught like this was a common phrase I heard from pastors. They would say, Jesus taught about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. And I'm like, well, then there you go. Like hell's real for sure. If Jesus talked about it. Mm -hmm. And when I was wrestling with those beliefs at 23, I went on this just manhunt to find real evidence of like, is this true or not? I'm going to go deep into these passages that all these Christians say are proof of hell. I'm going to backtrace the original etymology. 
And what I found is that the idea of hell as we are taught it appears nowhere in the Bible. The closest thing that appears in the Bible would be the lake of fire, which is in the book of Revelation. And the whole book of Revelation stated from the beginning is a dream that John has on the island of Patmos. It's not a literalistic book. There's, it talks about a dragon of seven heads coming out of the ocean. It talks about a ram with 10 horns and the virgin getting devoured by the dragon. It's clearly a metaphorical text. Mm -hmm. And then Christians get to this lake of fire that the devil's thrown into and they say, oh, proof of hell. Well, so it was all metaphor up to that verse and now it's literal. So you can't have it both it's ways. It's constantly picking and choosing when it's metaphor mm -hmm. and when it's literal too. Mm -hmm. A lot of picking thing. and choosing. Yeah. But on Jesus's term, they'll say, well, look at these passages and they'll point out uh, his parable of uh, Lazarus, uh, the, the poor man who dies and Lazarus is taken to heaven or Abraham's bosom, it says, not heaven. And the rich man is taken to Hades, not hell, but Hades. Now we know that Hades was a Greek mythological uh, story or belief. The god Hades rules the underworld, also called Hades. And, uh, you know, the Jews were m mixed and commingled with Greek culture for hundreds of years since before the Maccabean, you know, takeover and all of that. So Greek and Jewish culture was infused together. And we see that all through the New Testament that they had, you know, as every culture does, they absorb each other's beliefs and words and totally. stuff over time. So Jesus was drawing upon a Greek metaphor for a story, a parable. Mm -hmm. And he talks about Hades, not hell. And he says the rich man doesn't go, the poor man Lazarus doesn't go to heaven because he confesses Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He goes to heaven because he was poor and sick his whole life. That's the way you go to heaven. Yeah, Suffer enough and you go to heaven. That's, that's, that's not what Christians teach. Right. That's what Jesus taught. He was drawing a parallel as Jesus always did. He was doing these inversions of traditional religious thinking that in those days, this was a Greek belief that people that are poor and diseased have bad karma and the gods have cursed them from past lives, things they've done, whatever. And rich people were blessed by the gods because how else could they get wealth, right? Jesus says, no, no, no. The wealthy ones and the religious scholars with their big pointy hats are the ones who are going to go to Hades. And the poor people with leprosy are the ones that are going to be carried to the heavenly father. And it was this, he was trying to flip the tables on people to say, you've got it all wrong. You don't mm. understand who God really is. So that's, it's a parable, right? And he's, he's drawing from a Greek story there. And then the best one is when Jesus says in the book of Mark and Luke, um, he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off because it's better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven maimed than to um, have both hands and be thrown into the fires of hell, it says in the King James. So you look up that word hell, and it's actually the word Gehenna, which means the Valley of Hinnom. So it literally was a word that was a geographical location that the King James translated into this mythological story called hell. But no, it's a real place in Jerusalem. It was the city garbage dump where the garbage went, the, the lepers were only allowed to congregate there. They weren't allowed in the cities. And prisoners, um, thieves, criminals would have their bodies thrown in the fires of Gehenna to be burned. Because for a Jewish person, not having a proper burial was like the worst thing ever. Because mm. they believed in the resurrection. If your body gets burned, it can't resurrect. So they would burn the bodies of criminals and thieves as like the ultimate double middle finger. Mm -hmm. Like you're a sinner, you're going to get wiped out. And so Jesus is saying, if you're sinning, do whatever it takes to stop sinning because it's better to have only one hand and enter the kingdom of heaven than to have both hands and be thrown into the fires of Gehenna. Mm. And so he's talking about a real place that the first century Jews would have known when he mentioned it, right? So like, oh, speaking down the street. To their, speaking to what they knew and what yeah. was familiar to them. But we weren't, we're not first century Jews. So we hear it from this Western American lens like, oh hell, it's a real place. Like yeah. we're so far removed from the actuality of the scriptures that you really have to do your justice of like the hermeneutics and the theology of the day and studying that. And you get this totally different context. And to me, the final smoking gun on this is that Christians will say, uh, cause Jesus says better to be thrown into the fires of Gehenna where the worm does not die and the fires are not quenched. And they say, see, he's describing hell. When you go to hell, you're burned, worms eat you. And you know, they're not quenched. But he's actually quoting a passage from Isaiah, I want to say Isaiah 45, where God is condemning the Jews for sacrificing. This is just so crazy, bro. This makes me laugh every time. It's a passage. Jesus is quoting a passage where God is condemning the Jews for burning their children in the fires to the God Molech. Oh my God. And in that passage, God says, uh, for you committed the ultimate abomination by sacrificing your children in the fire to Molech. 
which I did not command you to do, nor would it ever enter my mind to have you do or to tell you to do. Right. And he says, therefore, I shall curse you and you shall be burned in Gehenna where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And remember, that's a real place, not a spiritual right. location. Right. So he's, it's a metaphor to say the fire's not quenched and the worms don't die doesn't mean you literally get eaten by worms forever because that's impossible. They'll run out of body to eat at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a metaphor, a poetic way of saying your destruction here and your punishment will be remembered forever in the lineage of the Jews. It'll be as if you're always being burned in the fires and eaten by the worms because everyone will remember your abomination. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It it's totally very metaphorical. Sense. Yeah. So Jesus, is, he quotes directly that passage where God says that burning your children in fire is an abomination. Wow. But that's the passage Christians use to say that God burns his children in fire. Yeah, which makes zero sense to me. Like that never made sense to me that an all loving God, that was the other piece, would ever condemn someone to eternal hell. Like that mm -hmm. makes zero sense. And you actually posted on your Instagram within the last few months, the best analogy, I think that you say you ask Christians, you say, picture your son or daughter doing the worst thing. I'm going to let you say it. You say it because you do it justice way better than I could. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Would you ever, would, could your kid do anything that would make you want to burn them in fire forever? Never, ever, ever. No chance. I have two kids. No way. And every Christian says that. Right. And so then I say, why, then why do you believe God does that to his kids? And they say, well, brother, God's ways are higher than our ways. Right. Or they'll say that, well, it's not God doing it. It's you choosing it through free will. And it's like, oh well, yeah, if, that's right. Right. People are swan diving into hell of their own free will. Yeah. <laughs> Makes zero <laughs> sense to me, man. I'm like, even, even so, if that were the case, don't you think God could then approach them after the fact and be like, hey, man, you did a lot of stuff in this life that wasn't really loving and didn't really represent me. I'm going to give you another chance mm -hmm. or I'm still going to welcome you into my loving arms. Right? Yes. Like. That is the loving thing to do. The mm -hmm. idea that, oh, your choices in this life with your limited knowledge and limited capacity and not having all the supreme knowledge that I have led you to make these decisions. Therefore, you chose that and you're going to go to hell for eternity. Yep. Makes zero sense. And it's nowhere in the Bible. Yeah. Like Jesus never once said, I'm going to die for your sins. Confess me as your Lord. Worship me as your Lord and Savior. Um, God's going to murder me instead of you so he can finally forgive you. Like none of that is in Jesus's language at all. Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite. He's walking around Jerusalem, announcing to people their sins are already forgiven mm -hmm. long before he's crucified. And even Paul says in second Corinthians, I believe two fifteen, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not the other way around mm -hmm. and not counting men's trespasses against them. Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you get out of that one? God was in Christ, not counting men's trespasses. I thought that Christians say he was counting our trespasses, and that's why he had to murder his own son. Well, this uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The idea that Jesus needed to die for our sins was based in the idea that God required blood sacrifice. You got it. So previously, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is another thing I think that we'll get into when we talk about the scenes, mm -hmm. another point of contention where they were like, no, that's incorrect. You got it. We're sacrificing animals or calling for animals to be sacrificed, calling for people to come sacrifice an animal on their altar, which they said was an altar to God because God necessitated blood sacrifice. And that's something that I've always asked Christians as I was stepping away from it. You're already presuming that God requires blood sacrifice in the first place. Mm -hmm. Can you show me any evidence of God requiring blood sacrifice and why? Because that's the whole story surrounding the necessity of Jesus dying for our sins because yeah. God required the final blood sacrifice being that he came down himself and was sacrificed for our sins. Yes. It's um, what sets God or Yahweh apart from any other ancient tribe and culture that all believed their gods demanded blood ritual sacrifices. I mean, it's very occulty, witchcrafty, demonic stuff to be sacrificing animals to atone for sins. Like that's what the negative polarity does. They use blood to uh, to enhance themselves and atone for things. Why do we think that God is no different than a tribalistic ancient deity who demanded blood sacrifices? Like I thought our God was set apart. I thought our God was holy. And, it, and in the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not kill, but yet God needs constant murder just to forgive people. I mean, in every way, it's a total contradiction of belief. To hold that belief as a Christian requires a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance that you have to live with because it's, again, it's not in the mouth of Jesus. It's completely contradictory to the gospel of Jesus. It's even contradictory to innumerable Bible verses. There's even a verse in, um, I want to say it's Isaiah, it might be Ezekiel, 
Um, you do not delight in sacrifice, or else I would give it. The sacrifices of God are not that of oxes and goats and beasts, but a broken and contrite spirit. This sacrifice alone, O God, you will not despise. One of the prophets wrote that in the Old Testament. You do not want sacrifices. Wow. And so in the Essene gospel, Jesus says to the, the people listening when he's teaching, God has given you this commandment, thou shalt not kill. And in those first 10 commandments I told you about that Moses supposedly brought down, it was a bit different than in the ones we know today of thou shalt not murder. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was thou shalt not kill any living thing for what God has made alive, let no man kill. Mm -hmm. And so then the people asked Jesus, well, Lord, if God doesn't want us to kill even the beasts, uh, why does God command us in the Old Testament to sacrifice animals? And Jesus says, because God gave you the commandment, thou shalt not kill, but the Jews were too wicked to keep that commandment. They had too much bloodlust and need for violence. And so as a concession, basically to their lower level of consciousness, God allowed them to sacrifice animals instead of killing one another. Because well, murder was still going on, war was still going on. They're probably still sacrificing people behind the scenes, but yep, right. probably it didn't even slow them down. Yeah. That God commanded them, "Thou shalt not kill." So God's like, "Okay, fine, don't kill people, just kill animals. And you mm -hmm. can get out your, you know, bloodlust on the animals." But Jesus says, "But the highest way of all is, thou shalt kill no living thing." Mm -hmm. And if you want to walk in real purity, you have to obey that law. Yeah, now we're getting to the to the juicy stuff, the meat of it, if you yeah. will. Um, so. You, okay, I don't even know where to start with this because I, I know you so well, so I'm like piecing together so much I yeah. know about you to try to form the best question. So let's start with this. What are the Essene Gospels of Christ? So it's a book called the Essene Gospel of Peace. No, that, the Essene Gospel of Peace, my bad. Yeah, yeah. and there's, there's many Essene Gospels and texts. I just ordered like 10 of them yesterday on Amazon. I'm like, I want to read all these, but um, the Essene Gospel of Peace just has changed my life in the best way ever. And it was Is this a, something you picked up recently? Yeah, within four months ago, probably. Okay. What what piqued your interest? Uh, our friend Daniel Raphael oh, okay. told me about it. Got it. Okay. And uh, so I bought it on Amazon and read it and immediately resonated so much with it and just was like, this is the real gospel of Jesus right here. And then I went on, you know, uh, obsessive search through the historical evidence for Jesus being in a scene and was just blown away at all the evidence. And I'm like, at this point, I'm like, there's no doubt in my mind. Jesus was in a scene. Um, I don't know how anyone could argue against it when presented with all the evidence there is. I hear a lot of people, well, Christian people say, oh, there's no evidence Jesus was in a scene. Mm. Like, brother, there's so much evidence, we could be here all night talking about Can it. Can you share some of it? Yeah, I actually have um, a, a short compilation of some of the historical figures who described the Essenes. Okay. And some just That's really- That's great, because I also want to touch on who the Essenes were for yeah, those oh, yeah. who don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll start with that. I mean, okay. so you asked who are the Essenes. They were one of the three main sects of Judaism in the first century. Historians say they began after the Maccabean revolt, um, where the Hasmoneans broke away from the Greek uh, empire, Alexander the Great, and um, I can't remember who the name he overthrew was, but 160 BC, around that time when the Jews revolted against the Greeks, the Essenes split off from the Pharisees and Sadducees, because the Pharisees and Sadducees were very legalistic Jews, followed the Torah to the letter, believed only the scriptures that, you know, there's no divinity outside of this, the scriptures at all. And the Essenes were the opposite. They said the scriptures are just loose pointers to the divine. The divine is the earth itself, nature itself, the stars, the heavenly father, the power of love, the power of wisdom, joy. These are the real angels of God that are with us that we must commune with. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's not that they completely cast aside the scripture. It's just that they essentially took what Jesus said that we mentioned earlier in this episode, and that's not where the heart of it is found. The heart of it is here and in internal. Yes. Right. They very much revered the scriptures as, um, I mean, Jesus talks about how you should read the scriptures and let them into your heart and let them open your heart to God because they're very holy, but they're just not God itself. Right. right? They're not to be worshiped. They're mm -hmm. to be used as a tool. Got it. And so the Essenes had to break off and distance themselves because of the great persecution that they faced at the hands of the Orthodox Jews. And so they found this dry, desolate, burning wasteland near the Dead Sea called the Valley of Qumran or the, the Qumran Valley. And they built 
their whole civilization into the caves in the Qumran Valley to kind of hide themselves from being out in the open. There was only about 4,000 of them. Because if they ever wandered into, you know, Jerusalem or something, wearing their traditional full white garbs, they'd be like stoned on the spot because these people thought they were heretics, right? So they had to stay far away from Orthodox Jews. And to them, the, you know, the burning wasteland of the Qumran desert was preferable to the persecution they, they would face in Israel. Wow. And so they kept secret knowledge. They had a very um, beautiful spiritual order, kind of like Rosicrucianism and different orders like that, which was the Essene Brotherhood. And you had to be initiated into it. And I can explain what that initiation looks like, but just the most beautiful spiritual path to follow, very simple in one sense, and also just so profound and heart centered that, again, when I read the book, I'm just like, I can't believe this culture existed. They're, they're to me like Atlantis or something. They're like this beautiful ancient culture of esoteric knowledge that got lost because, you know, the Romans sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. The, the Romans actually sacked the Essenes first in 68 AD. And again, everyone knew that they were the keepers of this secret knowledge or gnosis, which was the knowledge of oneness with God and all that, which was absolute heresy to the Orthodox Jews. So they kept it secret because you'd be killed for having this knowledge, right? So they were forced in their day and age to be very secluded and secretive about it. So it wasn't like they were just a cult or something. They had for their own life's sake to keep this knowledge Makes secret. Sense. And you had to prove to them through rituals like baptism and communion and uh, initiation by fasting in the desert that that's you were really- That's incredible. Yeah, that you were really committed to being in, a scene, in the Essene way. Yeah. And the real word, by the way, is uh, esaloi in uh, Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Essene is like a Greek translation of it. Got it. Um, so they were basically this mystical culture of, I believe, derived from Kabbalism, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about the tree of life a lot, which is originally from the Kabbalah. This mystical tradition of Jews that only existed for a short period of like 300 years, but thrived in the desert. And they even grew plants and vegetables and flowers and gardens out in the desert. Wow. And historians like uh, Philo and Josephus talk about this being like, we don't know how these people do this. They're mm -hmm. growing vegetables in the freaking desert and flowers and stuff. So they were an amazing culture and race of people. They were really good at creating microclimates through permaculture design. I think so. <laughs> That's probably what it was. Dude, they, they were so one with the earth. They understood natural law on such a deep level that they could do things like grow food in the desert. I believe it, man. I mean, I remember this, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but seeing Molly Englehart, my good friend, uh, her farm that she had in Fillmore, California. And it's not that the surrounding terrain was desert-like necessarily, but it was definitely a dry climate. Mm -hmm. But you look down at the ground where her regenerative farm was, and the soil was like rich. It was a little bit more humid right there. She's even taken some temperature guns and pointed at her soil versus the soil right next to hers. And it's like 20 degrees cooler on wow. her soil. So the ability through permaculture design um, and regenerative agriculture to create microclimates is absolutely a thing. I mean, I even think of uh, the movie Kiss the Ground, really incredible documentary on regenerative agriculture. Uh, they talked about how forget the guy's name. I actually interviewed him. But anyway, he oversaw the restoration of the Lewis Plateau in China, which used to be a desert. And they turned it into this lush, rich, really dense green landscape over the course of like 10 years or something like that. So absolutely, it's possible mm -hmm. to do that even in like a quote desert climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's incredible. Amazing. So what about the evidence? Actually, let's talk mm -hmm. about the initiation first. I want to know what it takes. So you, you talked about fasting and other things like this. Was mm -hmm. there anything else involved in initiating to be in a scene? So I don't fully understand the exact order and way they would do their initiation, but there's these ingredients that uh, come up in the Essene texts and the Essene gospels that... Uh, you can know these were part of the initiation. I don't know what order it happens mm -hmm. in, but the basic spiritual path of the Essenes was, it's called the sevenfold path of peace. Mm -hmm. And it's to live at peace with the earthly mother and the heavenly father and their seven angels. So they had seven angels of the earthly mother, seven angels of the heavenly father, and we are to commune with the angels, or Jesus calls it walking with the angels. And what they would do is they would wake up at sunrise, go to sleep at sunset, after sunset, and they would commune in the morning with the angels of the earthly mother. And then in the evening, they would commune with the angels of the earthly father. 
and specifically one angel per day. So the Sabbath started for them on Friday evening. So they would commune with the heavenly father in the evening of Friday, Saturday morning, they commune with the earthly mother, like the spirit of the earthly mother. They, there's certain prayers they write in there. Got it. Okay. And that's what they mean by communing. They would, they would pray. Mm -hmm. Okay. And literally get involved with the angels, like the angel of sunlight, the angel of earth, like ah, work okay. in the earth, use the earth, be in the sunlight. But like the prayers that they give, it's so cool because Jesus says, you know, when you wake up to commune with the earthly mother, pray like this. But then Jesus qualifies it and says, but don't just let these be dry, dead words. Let them be alive in your heart when you pray them. And then the, he just gives these beautiful prayers, dude. There's poetry in motion. And so the, the path is angel of, uh, angel of the earthly mother in the morning, heavenly father in the evening. And you do that for all seven days of the week. And you do that for seven years. And after seven years, you become a, a son of light or you become initiated as part of the Essene Brotherhood. Hmm. And I believe that you would have to um, do a 40 day, 40 night in the wilderness where you have nothing to rely upon but the angels of the earthly mother and wow. the heavenly father. And a 40 day, maybe a dry fast, maybe a water fast. 40 probably day dry, dry fast would be intense. In the desert, bro. Dude, insane. Like this is unbelievable that they would do this, but they, got, they would get so charged in the spirit from... And a lot of fasting, so they prepared their body for this, that by the time they went through this initiation, it's the kind of thing of like, you won't survive this. First of all, you won't even do this unless you're ridiculously committed to living this level so of purity. So any Pharisees and Sadducees oh, yeah. that tried to infiltrate, they're like, all right, I'm not about that life. I'm not no doing shot. this. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, next level stuff we're yeah. talking about. But not only would you not even do it, there's no way you'll survive it yeah. unless you truly are communing with the angels, mm -hmm. unless you can live by sunlight alone, mm -hmm. like breatharians would and stuff. And we can get into, I have theories on that as well, but seven years of communing with the angels or walking with the angels turns you from a son of man to a son of God or a son of light. God is light in whom there is no darkness. And so you have Jesus saying these words in the New Testament, son of man, son of God. And son of man refers to like the uninitiated. Everybody in the world is a son of man. Yeah. Uh, but the initiates who've gone through this sevenfold path of peace and inner purification of the Essenes would become a son of God because to them, it's about joining earth and heaven within yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's this beautiful drawing of uh, the, the tree of life, they call it. And it's a picture of a man in a meditative position. Half of his body is under the earth. The other half is above the earth inside of a tree. And the tree has seven roots and seven branches going up to the heavens. And the seven roots represent the seven angels of the earthly mother. The seven branches are the seven angels of the heavenly father. And the point of the sevenfold path of peace is to join earth and heaven in yourself. Isn't that amazing? Dude, that's so cool. We lost this, bro. Like yeah. this was a real race of people who taught this and practiced this. And they have a real spiritual path to do this. You can read about. Wow. And I just got so lit up on it that I immediately started following it, doing the practices. I took up the, the Jesus diet, as I call it. And I mean, in just like a couple months time. I can't explain how much it's come alive in me. It's just incredible. Wow. Wow. It resonates with me quite a bit. I, I want to touch on where we first learned about the Essenes. And I don't think it was necessarily the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's historical evidence yes. of them other than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. But I do want to touch on the Dead Sea Scrolls as it relates to the Essenes. I've not looked into them that much. So can you share what you know about the Dead Sea Scrolls briefly? I know that they were found by a, a shepherd boy. Did you know this story? Mm-hmm. He was uh, looking, so ironic, I looking know. for a lost sheep, yeah. just like Jesus's parable, yeah. finds the treasure trove of ancient knowledge and gnosis in the uh, caves of Qumran, the Nag Hammadi libraries. And, uh, you know, people came to pillage them and steal them. But eventually people figured out like, oh, these are like ancient sacred Hebrew texts. So then quickly, you know, historians and people come over and start translating them. And they're like, oh, these are like early Christian gospels and stuff. And they also had preserved countless copies of the Old Testament, um, the entire Old Testament, except for the book of Esther, strangely mm. enough. And there's some speculation on why they didn't preserve the book of Esther, because Esther teaches that men are superior to women. Uh, and in the Essene culture, first of all, um, Philo says this, I think Josephus says this as well, they were the only culture of the time who denounced slavery wow. as being wrong. They didn't eat meat. And they didn't, they definitely didn't sacrifice animals, but they didn't eat meat, mm -hmm. unlike the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm -hmm. 
And they also didn't believe women were inferior to men. They, women were equal in their culture. Women could be initiates wow. in the Essene way. So they were obviously a very mystical culture. So that's, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in 1947 or okay. something like that. Yeah. 54. Edmund Bordeaux Zales- Zalecki. Zekli. Zekli. Thank Zekli. you. He was, he discovered the Essene gospel of peace in the, the secret archives of the Vatican in 1923. He, um, as I was telling you earlier, he was an 18 year old kid in Catholic missionary school and he wrote his final dissertation on St. Francis, who is like this living embodiment of Christ and Essene teachings. And he, it so stirred his own teacher that he sent it to his good friend who was, and I read the book on this from Edwin Bordeaux Zalecki, who, um, describes the whole story of how he found the gospel. And so I, I forget the names exactly now of the bishop who was presiding over the secret archives, but he was friends with his teacher, sends him his uh, document and says, read this. My, one of my students wrote this. And he's like, wow, this is amazing. Like, can you send this kid here to live in the Vatican and study under us? We want to initiate him into the order and stuff. So Edmund Bordeaux is like blown away. And he's like, I can't believe this is the adventure of a lifetime to be offered to go there. And he was studying Greek and Latin and was already trans- learning to translate. And so he had to go learn Hebrew and Aramaic at the Vatican, which he did. And so he's given, uh, he earns the favors of the bishop who's presiding over the secret archives. And there's these beautiful stories, man, that they write that this guy really was, for being a Catholic, very tapped in and like very in the heart. And he encouraged Edmund to go find what he called uh, the source of St. Francis. He said, St. Francis is the, the ocean that we can see. You know, we know about St. Francis's life. But we need to find the stream that led to the ocean, meaning what teachings did St. Francis himself get inspired by that led him to become this person? And then that stream has to originate at a source somewhere. And so he says, find the source, my son. And he gives him the key. So Edmund spends years going through the archives, reading texts, different, uh, different Gnostic texts they'd had. And eventually he's given the key to the ultimate like secret room, the forbidden room. Uh, once he finds the stream, he says, which was St. Jerome and St. Benedict's writings on the Essenes. He's like, I found these, these two um, saints, St. Jerome from the second century and St. Benedict from the fourth century, were writing about the Essenes and practicing their teachings. And he was like, you found the stream, my son, now go find the source. And he gives him the key to the secret room. He goes in the secret room and starts looking through the scrolls and he finds this Essene gospel of peace. And so he was somewhat adept at Aramaic and Hebrew, so he could like read it and understand it. And he was just blown away. And he's like, this is it. This wow. is the source of those teachings that St. Jerome and Benedict were practicing in the early second and fourth centuries that quickly got wiped out by the well, Catholic can, can Church. I, can I share something real quick too? Mm-hmm. So as I was looking up the Essene Gospel of Peace prior to this, of course, Wikipedia says that it's a completely fabricated text. And then representatives from the Vatican have also come out saying that it's a completely fabricated text. But we know that the Library of Alexandria, there's a lot of people who say all of the, like, oh, all the books were burned during the Library of Alexandria. But a lot of people will say, and I tend to agree with this, that the books that were important were just transferred and hidden at the Vatican. Mm -hmm. So the Vatican has all of the secret occult and occult a lot of people think that in a negative context, right. it's not a negative thing. It just is. It's like, it's esoteric knowledge that yes. is very important that can be used for bad or for good. But mm-hmm. point being that all of this occult knowledge is actually hidden in these archives in the Vatican that they only let certain people in on. So yeah. I don't know whether this is true and you've read it and it sounds, it resonates with me so far. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's of course the Vatican's going to say that it's completely va- fabricated. And of course, Wikipedia taking from the Vatican is going to say mm-hmm. that it's completely fabricated. I mean, just what you're talking about, taking the seven angels of the earth, the seven angels of heavenly Father. the heavenly father and merging them inside of you. And that's like, you're supposed to merge heaven and earth here within yourself. Mm-hmm. Dude, makes total sense. And yep. it's incredible. It resonates so deeply with me. It does. Yeah. And they call the universe, um, they call it the garden of eternal life. Um, the, the eternal sea, they also called it. That we're basically the universe is like God's garden or uh, this ocean of eternal life that we're swimming in. And they said in the center of it stands the tree of life. So you're like, where's the center of the universe? It's not literal, right? They're, they're talking metaphysically that at the center of all creation is this tree of life. There's these seven angels of earth and heaven. 
and we're supposed to embody those principles of those angels within us. And so the earthly mother is the angel of sunlight, the angel of water, the angel of earth, the angel of air, the angel of life, which is like those four elements create life. And so it leads to life and life is like youthfulness, vibrancy, energy to be, I'm alive. You know, that's a, an angel of God, they say. And then joy is the sixth angel because being alive, being full of life leads to joy. And it's also the way they describe it in the Essene gospel. It's also like the ability to see the beauty of nature is the angel of joy. The angel of joy unlocks the spiritual awareness to see the divine energy in all the earth around you, nature around you. So it's like you obey the four elements, you live according to them, you are full of life, being full of life leads to joy, and then the seventh angel is the earthly mother herself. So those are the seven angels of the mother. The seven angels of the father are the angel of uh, power, the angel of love, the angel of wisdom, the angel of peace, the angel of work, which is really cool because the angel of work is like the law of vibration. It says that everything in God's kingdom is working. Mm. or moving, mm. vibrating. And so we ourselves should reflect that by ourselves working and being active in the world, not being lazy and stuff. Right. Um, was that five I, I mm -hmm. listed? Heavenly Father is the last one. And uh, I think I missed one. But anyway, that gives you an idea. Right. So again, in the morning, you would commune with like the angel of sunlight. So they would say on Mondays, you go out in the sun and you pray to the sun and say, thank you, sun, for sending your cosmic rays to fill me with life. And you say these beautiful prayers, and then in the evening, probably in a meditation or something, you pray to the angel of love, or whatever the correlating angel is. On the tree of life diagram, each branch and root is like Cor a cross yeah, correlation it. to each other. So it's listed out of what days, what angels you pray to and commune with. Um, yeah, and it's just this beautiful pathway of inner purification. Mm -hmm. Wow. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though, is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. So before we get deep into the teachings of the Scene Gospel of Peace, let's, let's touch back on the evidence that Christ himself wasn't a scene. Yeah, you know, for that, we, I don't even need to look at all of the historians and philosophers that spoke about the Essenes and all the different evidence that we can gather there, because there's so much of it just in the Bible. And the first and foremost would be those rituals I mentioned that, okay, so we have communion, Jesus giving communion at the Last Supper. Communion does not appear in the Old Testament. It's not, it was not a Jewish, Orthodox Jewish practice. Uh, baptism in water doesn't appear in the Old Testament, not, in a, not a Jewish practice. And the scenes were all about water and water yes. rituals, right? It was literally submerging yourself in the angel of water to purify you as a symbol of your initiation into the Essene order. So you'd be baptized before you started your Essene initiation in the brotherhood, and you would do your 40-day, I imagine, 
you would finish with the ultimate initiation of 40 days in the wilderness. So anyway, um, Jesus does those three things, communion, baptism, and um, the 40 days in the wilderness that we know are Essene rituals. To me, that's case closed, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like you, you don't get someone who walks around condemning Pharisees and Sadducees, who was himself a Jew, and then say he was an Orthodox Jew. Like, right. There was only three sects of Jews at that time, and he definitely wasn't a Pharisee or Sadducee. Right. So there's only one left, one option left. So that's plenty of evidence for me. But deeper than that, um, the Essenes saw Enoch, not Abraham, as their father. They were an Enochian uh, sect of Jews, not an Abrahamic sect of mm -hmm. Jews. And that's because Enoch came before Abraham, number one. And Enoch in the Bible in Genesis, there's just a very short verse that says, Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. Meaning he was so one with God that God couldn't even stand the physical separateness and took him up to heaven. Wow. So kind of like a pre-Christ ascension type of figure, right? It became a rainbow light body instantaneously because it's like, all right, yeah. you're not fit for here. Come back up yeah. here. You're yeah. too enlightened for earth. Yeah. So they, they saw Enoch as the founder of their faith and the brotherhood because he walked closer to God than anybody did. And so they read the book of Enoch as their revered text, which as we know was cast out of the biblical canon. But in the book of Enoch, there's over a hundred sayings, like exact sayings, that Jesus himself says in the New Testament. So if you, if you read the book of Enoch and you know it's languaging well, you read the New Testament, you're like, well, Jesus is quoting Enoch constantly. Wow. So who do we know revered Enoch? The Essenes. Wow. So in like the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Essenes, you'll see these phrases like, we are the voices of those crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his pathways. And we see John the Baptist saying the same thing. And Jesus says that about John the Baptist. And Jesus calls John the Baptist the greatest of those born among women. Wow. And there's almost no argument in, in theology and hermeneutics that John the Baptist wasn't an Essene. There's a lot of evidence that he was, you know, he lived in the wilderness like the Essenes did, ate wild honey like the Essenes did, um, and went around baptizing a known Essene ritual. And Jesus calls him the greatest. So it's like, here's all this mounting evidence that Jesus was likely a part of that group. And the Essenes, by the way, were known for practicing physical healing. Wow. There was two main sects of Essenes, the Nasoreans and the Oseans, which were North and South uh, branches. and both of them practiced healing, but the uh, I think it's the Oceans were actually written by, I want to say either Pliny or Philo, saying that they were known healers and people would travel there to get healed by them. They had like a healing ministry. Wow. And so I think that they probably did that through holistic health remedies and the laying on of hands, but physical healing by touch, transmutation of energy wasn't a scene practice. Totally. What do we see Jesus doing all through the Gospels? Healing people, laying hands on them. I think the other important point here. <clears throat> referring back to my um and probably your internal sort of disenfranchisement if that's a word with with mm -hmm. the church is that Jesus continually even in the new testament pointed to the reality that the miracles he's doing we could also do yeah. but then the modern church sort of looks like some of these what you could say are esoteric practices and like even the ability to bend spoons, right? Like I've done that and yeah. some of the things that you witnessed in your church growing up. But a lot of other churches would say that, no, we don't have those capabilities. That's blasphemous. That's satanic. That's witchcraft mm -hmm. to do any of those things. Yeah. Which is another thing that was a huge problem for me. Well, Jesus said, you'll do greater works than I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jesus didn't say, worship me. He said, follow me. Mm -hmm totally different, right? And in fact, Jesus tells people not to worship him in the New Testament. When people try to worship him, he, t he tells them not to. And then he says, don't tell anyone about me or what just happened. Doesn't sound like a Messiah coming to save everybody, you know what I mean? Announcing his arrival. Like he was like, shh, don't tell anybody. Don't yeah. worship me. Only God is good. Yeah. Wow. How does that line up with what we were taught in church, right? Doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. So let, let's get into some of the, uh, the, the nitty gritty details of what the scene gospel of peace teaches. Okay. So, well, so let's, let me just quickly go through some of the historic evidence from like Oh, Philo you have more. And, oh, tons. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I only wrote down a small number of them, but these, these are going to blow your mind, bro. I can't wait for this. 
So we have Philo, who was um, basically an Alexandrian philosopher who wrote a lot around the first and second centuries. And he called the Essenes in one of his texts, a race by themselves, because they were isolated, mm -hmm. more remarkable than any other in the world, he said, the oldest of the initiates receiving their teaching from Central Asia, which would be like Persia, Tibet type mm -hmm. of area, probably. Uh, teachings perpetuated through an immense space of ages, constant and unalterable holiness. Those were his descriptions of the Essenes. Wow. So Edmund Bordeaux did a lot of research on this, wrote books on this, some that I'm reading now, that the Essenes got a lot of their traditions from Zoroastrianism, mm. um, one of those ancient spiritual mystical traditions, and then Buddhism. Buddhists have uh, the Bodhi tree of life. The Essenes have the tree of life. Because yeah. you'll see like, oh yeah, it's the same principle. It's this clear picture of roots going down, branches going up, Buddha right in the middle. It's exactly like the Essene tree of life. And then just if you study Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism you, you understand all the parallels to what the Essenes are teaching. And so he believes that they gather their teachings from them. Philo seems to back that up, but nevertheless. So there's this phrase, the son of man, used in the book of Enoch over and over. And it's also... That phrase is also used in the Old Testament a little bit, Book of Daniel and other places, but it's all throughout the Book of Enoch, and Jesus constantly refers to himself as the Son of Man. Um, we talked about communion, baptism, healing by laying on of hands, initiation through fasting in the wilderness. These are all things that Philo records as Essene rituals. Philo said, it is the Essenes' first creed to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So the Essenes had creeds when you would initiate into the brotherhood of the Essenes to follow that path. They had certain creeds you would, uh, of your own free will, give consent to, right? And he said, the first creed of the Essenes is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In Matthew ch chapter 6, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. A, a, a literally an Essene creed, Jesus teaches it. Philo says, uh, another creed of the, the brotherhood was lay up nothing on earth, lay up nothing for yourself on earth, but fix your mind solely upon heaven. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus also says, lay up not for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. A known Essene creed. Wow. Here's a third one. Philo says, part of the Essene Brotherhood creed was to forsake father and mother, house and land for the faith. And that means like you have to leave living with your parents, live with the order, the Essene order, you have to be willing to give up anything and everything to follow this. Nothing mm -hmm. can be more important to you than this. And in Luke 18, Jesus said, There is no man that has left house, nor parents, nor brothers, nor children, nor house, nor land, for the kingdom of God's sake, who will not receive manifold more. Another Essene creed, right? Philo said, The Essenes were adamant never to call any earthly man father or master, for we have one father and master alone, our father in heaven. Mm. Matthew 23, Jesus says, call no man on earth your father, for you have one father in heaven. Wow. Also in Essene. So there's four Essene creeds right there, spoken from the mouth of Jesus. Yeah. Several times, um, Josephus uh, was described the Essenes and wrote about them in his books. Um, one is called The Wars of the Jews, where he was documenting the Roman-Jewish war going on. Um, he says, so he uses the word es esaios which was the Hebrew word for Essene. Um, so he names, let me know if you recognize any of these names. He's naming actual figures he knew of. Judas of the Esaios race, Simon of the Esaios race, John the Esaios, uh, those who are called by us Esaloi, is another way of saying it. Simon, a man of the Esaios race. Uh, this was in the Wars of the Jews. Those are all the names of the disciples. 100%. Right? Yeah. And, he, and Josephus, the historian, is calling them of the Essene race. Wow. Wow. A astounding, isn't it? Maybe they're just common names, but I doubt it. Those are uncanny. Those are four specific yeah. names that were Could also Jesus' disciples. Yeah. yeah. But like the irony is pretty rich right, there. Right, right. Whenever the Essenes go out to speak, this is Josephus in one of his historical writings. Whenever an Essene goes out to speak, they take nothing with them. They take nothing for the wants of their body. So this was part of the Essene way of living was that we trust the angels of the earthly mother and heavenly father to provide all of our needs. When we travel, we, we just walk out and we have full trust that they'll provide for us. Wow. In Luke 10, Jesus says, telling his disciples when he sent them out, 
to go preach the gospel, he says, carry neither purse nor bag with you nor sandals. Take nothing with you for the needs of your body. Wow. Wow. wow Crazy, wow. right? Incredible. Yeah. No, this is this one to me is maybe the most amazing. Um, there's a man named Epiphan, Epiphanius, who was the bishop of Constantia in 367 AD, wrote, They who believed in Christ were called Essenes before they were called Christians. Whoa. So the original Christians yes. were the Essenes. Essenes. Wow. And that's because at the Council of Nicaea in 365, when they put the Bible together, um, they had to come up with a new name for this religion yeah. of the, the way of followers of the way they were called. Mm-hmm. Because Jesus said, I am the way. Mm-hmm. Back before 365 AD, they were called Essenes, or they were called followers of the way. But the Essenes were the one carrying the teachings of Jesus through these kinds of books, like the Essene Gospel. And they came up with the name Christian at the Council of Nicaea to make the official Roman name of the religion that they were going to constitute, right? Yeah. But Epiphania says before they were called Christians, they were called Essenes. Because the, Jesus was in a scene mm-hmm. and came from that culture and went into Jerusalem to speak the knowledge. And there's even a passage I read somewhere in one of the Gospels where Jesus says something like, um, why should we keep this knowledge to ourselves that can be the salvation of all men? Uh, knowledge that is kept hidden from others is like uh, precious food that is left to rot in a home and not eaten. You know, like we need to give this knowledge out. So my personal theory on who Jesus was, was he was, a, he was probably some kind of prodigy child that was recognized from an early age as being uh, special in that way. Mm-hmm. Now, there's some speculation from uh, biblical historians and uh, like non-Christian biblical historians and people who've studied the Essenes mm-hmm. in their culture, that even the word Nazarene is actually, etymologically, it's a mi- mismatch, uh, mishmash of the word Essene or Naz, Nazar and Essene. Oh, wow. Yeah, Nazarene. because Nazarene, okay. The actual town Jesus was purported to have been born in, it's called Nazareth mm-hmm. in the King James, which is like a King James translation of Nazareth in Greek. But the Hebrew Aramaic name was Nazar or mm-hmm. Nazar. And so you have Nazar and then Essene. And if you combine them, it would be a Nazarene. It's like God, a shortened way wow. of saying that. Can't can't be proven, but that etymologically kind yeah. of pans out. And again, the two main sects we know of were the Nasoreans and the Ossians, mm-hmm. two branches of Essenes, and they have the een at the end in the suffix or whatever. So Jesus the Nazarene was he was an uh, Essene from Nazar, right? That's that was his birthplace. And Nazar was in the Qumran Valley desert region where we know the Essenes live. So it's like how much more that evidence do we need at this point? Right. You know. Do you think that, not to go off on a tangent, the Council of Nicaea, do you think that really, even with it being the foundation of Christianity, was also the downfall or the split of Christ's true teachings and then this dogmatic wrapped up version of it? Absolutely. Yeah. It turned Jesus's message, which was a message of oneness with God and again, follow me, follow my way. I am the demonstration of how you should live. I am is the way. I am is the way. I am is in you. Um, that got bastardized into this blood sacrifice, witchcrafty religion called Outsourcing Christianity. Yeah, yeah. That the only way to atone for evil is more evil. Mm-hmm. You know, like oh, you you're a sinner. Well, God needs to do the worst possible sin to atone for your sins. Makes That's no sense. not nowhere near the gospel that Jesus preached. Right. Jesus said, "Forgive your enemies seventy times seven. Turn the other cheek. Walk the extra mile. Do not resist temptation or do not resist evil." But, you know, forgive those who do evil. And Jesus said, your heavenly father has already forgiven your sins. You're the one holding your sins against yourself. Mm. I mean, this was his message, right? And it got turned into a kind of cultish belief that you're supposed to confess a certain verbal doctrine with your mouth. And somehow that will save you Mm. as if words have some kind of magic power. So we've got witchcraft, magic, spell casting, all these weird pagan ideas, which were prevalent in Rome. Um, in Christianity. Mm. Over time, these things just get so diluted with other cultures and belief systems. So again, you got to trace the ocean back to the stream, back to the source, which was these original teachings. And when you study them and you, you read these confirmations from many famous historians, Pliny, Philo, Josephus, Epiphanius, and they're all confirming this stuff, 
you go, oh, we lost the message. <gasps> it got screwed up along the way, yeah. as does everything, right? Right, 100%. Man, I, you're speaking of forgiveness there, and then a lot of stuff regarding karma came up for me. And as I understand it, the way to stop the wheel of karma is through genuine forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And another thing you brought up regarding, uh, you know, you are causing suffering for your own sins. You are already forgiven. Mm -hmm. Reading this book called The Red Lion, and it's a book on metaphysical transmutation and alchemy. And it talks about how the astral entities that feed off of you and your, I guess you could say, misaligned decisions are all a product of your own creation because, again, you are already forgiven even by those who you trespassed against on the highest level. You know, the, the true essence of who they are has already forgiven you, but you are perpetuating your own suffering because you won't forgive yourself, which ironically then leads you to do more things yeah. that are not in alignment with God. Right. And to me, that's the crux of the fallacy of the mainstream Christian message that by somehow confessing another guy as my Lord and Savior, because God brutally murdered him, mm -hmm. I can sort of by proxy share in his blood ritual sacrifice and have my sins atoned for. And so we believe that I've confessed a man and now I don't have any more sin, but yet I do. Mm -hmm. My behavior is just as sinful. That was always my problem as a Christian was like, I prayed, I confessed Jesus as Lord every freaking day because I was lusting, sinning, lying, deceiving, you know, and I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I begged God to take my sin away. And yet I kept on sinning. Mm -hmm. And I had this guilt complex, as most Christians do, that it's like, and then I, they end up hiding the things that they're actually yeah. doing. That's why there's a lot of corruption in mm -hmm. the church. A lot. Because what you, what you suppress has to grow inside of you. And so it's like, if this man, Jesus, is a savior, which I do believe, by the way, mm -hmm. but in a different way right. than Christians say, and if we say he's forgiven our sins and atoned for them and washed us white as snow, then why are we still sinning? A Christian looks at me and says, brother, my sins have been atoned for by the blood of Christ. Well, I see him right there. Right. I see your sins. I see you lusting. I see you lying. I see you being selfish. I see the sin. It's not gone just because you prayed a prayer. Your sin is atoned for when you embody eternal truth, when you embody the Christ. Jesus said, follow me, become like me, die to yourself like I died to myself and be resurrected to your eternal nature like I was, that's the message of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not totally. a blood sacrifice message. Totally, totally. And it, and it requires that you take 100% responsibility for your own actions. You can't keep on just living this lifestyle of sinning over and over. I guess the, the way that I've contextualized it with how I grew up as a Christian is you could just do and this isn't what they teach, but this is the way that I received it. And this is the way that many it's people- It's an unspoken it. teaching. Right. They, I just do whatever the hell I want. And as long as I repent for my sins, then I'm good. Hey, free, and, get out of jail free card. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas this approach is now like, no, no, no. You will create karma and you will create more maladaptive behaviors. The more yes. that you continue on sinning, you really need to correct the behavior, which start as knowing who you truly are. Yes. At your core, internally, not externally, not something outside of you that, you know, you have guides mm -hmm. and things like this and teachings outside of you, but it's embodied internally in order for you to understand who you truly are. So you don't engage in those behaviors as much anymore. Yes. That's it. And you know, of course, in miracles, right? The, the basic teaching of it, it's purported to have been channeled by Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the basic teaching is that the pathway to heaven is through forgiving your brother mm -hmm. and seeing him as the Christ. And having no impurities in your mind or your heart towards anybody, but seeing only Christ in all, and you are now in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Like you're a citizen of the kingdom when all you see are other citizens of the kingdom. That's the message, right? And after studying the Essene gospel, I'm even more convinced than ever that Jesus did channel A Course in Miracles because his message is very similar in the well, Essene let's, gospel. Let's get into it. We've been, we've been dancing around yeah, it for a yeah. while. So let's get into what he teaches in the Essene gospel. Let me just, I'll give you an idea. This is a prayer Jesus. Jesus gives a lot of prayers to pray and they're just beautiful, dude. And this is one he gives to pray. And you'll see this philosophy here I'm talking about. He says, pray like this. I enter the eternal and infinite garden of mystery. My spirit in oneness with the heavenly father. My body in oneness with the earthly mother. My heart in harmony with all my brothers, the sons of men, dedicating my spirit, my body, my, and my heart to the holy, pure, and saving teaching, even that teaching which of old, which was known to Enoch. So he's teaching that this is the path of purity for the Essenes is uh, peace in my mind, love in my heart, health in my body. Those three pillars make you a son of light, 
And you gain those three pillars by communing with the angels every day, over and over again. They purify you. And so in the Essene Gospel of Peace, I, I cracked it open to read it for the first time. And I start reading it, and it just blew my mind because you being somebody who knows so much also about holistic health, um, you're going to love it as well because it's basically Jesus just giving this holistic health dissertation to these sick people who keep coming to him. Each chapter is like a group of sick people come and they're like, Lord, help us. We're suffering from this and this and that. We know you alone have the power to heal us. And so Jesus teaches them how to heal and he doesn't do it by just laying his hands on them and healing them. But he says, basically, you have violated natural laws. You've disobeyed the laws, which are the angels of your earthly mother and your heavenly father. And so your body is full of sin and evil and negative karma. And so to heal your body, you have to atone for those sins by submitting yourself to the angels wow. of the earthly mother and heavenly father. And so he teaches them how to fast, how to eat healthy, organic food. He teaches them um, how to do enemas in the river. He teaches them uh, all kinds of detoxification methods. Uh, and what's cool about it is whatever problem the people have when they come to Jesus, like one chapter, there's people that have gnarled feet, their mm -hmm. bones or feet are twisted up and knotted. And they're like, Lord, help us. We, we can't even walk on our feet anymore. We've done everything. We can't heal it. And Jesus basically says, uh, Satan, which is like Jesus's term for like negative energy, is living in your feet, has found a home in your feet. And so you need to submit yourself to the angel of earth to purify you. So he gives them the prescription to go sink their feet into a mud bath for seven Essentially days. Essentially grounding and yeah. getting all the minerals from the mud, probably yep. like zeolites and stuff like this. And he says the angel of earth will pull the impurities out of your bones. Wow. And they do. And it says their feet were straightened and they could walk upright and they praised the Lord. Oh. And as it goes on like that, yeah. the most amazing one to me, I think I told you about, was that Jesus casts a demon out of a man using raw milk. Mm -hmm. Incredible passage, bro. What happens is it's like the, I think it's the final sick person that comes to Jesus throughout the chapters and all the sick people that are now like disciples of Jesus because he healed them. They're like, Lord, this man has suffered more than all of us put together. Day and night, we hear him weeping and gnashing his teeth by the caves. Um, he's, he's prayed, he's fasted, he starved himself, and he can't get rid of this demon. And you know, if you don't help him, he's going to die, basically. And so this poor man can't even walk. They carry him over to Jesus, and he can barely speak. And he's like, Lord, I've prayed and fasted, as you said, and the demon will not leave me. And Jesus says, basically, like, your sins are very great, and so you have a great demon inside of you. And he says, when you starve yourself, basically says, you're pissing the demon off by starving yourself. Because the demon has become one with your body. That's what evil spirits do, negative mm -hmm. entities do, is they leech onto you based on anchor points you've made available totally. of negative karma. So mm -hmm. if I suffer from depression... A negative entity that is in that vibration of depression can latch onto that mm -hmm. in me and then supercharge it and make it worse and it can speak to me. You know what I mean? So he's saying, You've allowed some negative entity into your body and you're starving it. And because it is now your body, it's living in your body, you're starving it to death and it's mad at you. So it's lashing out at you. So he says, We need to create some kind of medium to transfer it out of your body. And so he's, he goes over to a goat, milks the goat into a pail pours the pail of milk on the ground and they're in the desert, the scorching hot desert. So it says the, the angel of sunlight begins to heat up the milk and in the milk is the angel of water because water is in milk. And in there is also the angel of earth because it's poured it into the soil. So he, he mixes those three angels and I guess the angel of air because it, it starts to evaporate into steam. So now he gets all four angels working in the raw milk and he tells the man to breathe in the fumes of the raw milk steam and he breathes it in and he, he basically says the devil in you will not be able to resist the sustenance it wants and it will basically leap out of you to try to get it. And that's what happens. He breathes in the milk and he starts to convulse and cough and all this stuff and he kind of passes out on Jesus's lap and Jesus says, behold, and this, it says this black worm crawls out of his mouth. Wow. And onto the ground. And then it says, Jesus takes two stones and cuts off its head and its tail. And then it says, behold, Satan, who has now left the, his body. And the man wakes up and he's, the color comes back into his skin and he's saved and healed and he thanks Jesus. And so you're like, wow, this is a very different picture of Jesus right. than the one in the New Testament. Um, 
And I loved it so much because it's all based on natural law, holistic health, that like we have power to heal just through living according to natural law and obeying the angels of earth and all of that and of heaven. And so as the gospel goes on, what really struck me was this diet that Jesus lays out. And the story is kind of cool because I was up one night, woke up in the middle of the night, 2.30 a.m., and I just could not sleep. You know when you wake up at night and you know how awake you are? Mm -hmm. You're like, dang, I'm really freaking awake. So I might as well just, yeah, yeah, might as well just get up. So I just woke up burning eyes wide awake at 2.30, which never happens to me. And I just felt this deep pull to go upstairs and read the Essene Gospel of Peace because I had like one chapter left. So I go up at 2.30 a.m. and start reading this book, and I just get enthralled in this passage where Jesus lays out how to eat according to natural law and the way God intended, and he goes through every single facet of how to eat, like the way to eat, what to eat, everything. And it resonated so much with me that I was just reading it going like, I can't believe it. This is the perfect spiritual diet. Wow. And so I immediately started following it, and uh, I, can, I can read off all the things Jesus gives if you want. Yeah, let's, let, can, let's, let's get into that. So it begins with him talking about only eating things that are locally grown. So don't eat, he says, don't eat food that comes from far away. And a big principle of this is that what actually benefits us in food is the life force energy of the creator. In you it. listened to my fasting episode, right? Yes. Did you hear what I said about nutrition and how I look at it now? Yes, but remind me. I basically said that I am convinced that nutrition, is, we're approaching it in a completely incorrect way, that we look at food as our primary source of nourishment, when in reality, our body takes multiple sources of chi or life force energy to convert for the body's use for whatever the body needs to do. That's sunlight, that's grounding, that's having good conversations, that's feeling feelings deeply, that's drinking proper air, water, prana. air, right? Like. Yep all of these other things. And then that's how you recontextualize how there's people who have been raw vegan for 40 years and are extremely healthy that a lot of hardcore carnivore people will point to and be like, oh, that doesn't happen. They're lying. And then likewise, I've interviewed raw vegans who will point to carnivore people who are eating primarily just meat and say, oh, that doesn't happen. They're lying. And it's yeah. like, no, it's unique to the individual. And it's all about being able to convert various sources of chi into life force energy. Yes. And that's the way I look at nutrition now. Dude, I'm so with you. Yeah. And so is Jesus yeah. in, in the Essene Gospels. Um, the idea is what you're saying is that what really gives life to us is the life force energy in the food. Right. Uh, they, he calls it, or the Essenes call it the stream of life. They say, eat that which has the stream of life in it, meaning only eat food that's alive mm -hmm. because it's the aliveness that gives health to your body. And Jesus says, he who eats uh, the flesh of dead beasts eats the flesh of death. And invites death into the body. Let's st let's stop there real quick because I want to give context on where you're coming from too. Yeah, which yeah. this is something that I appreciate so much about you, in that you don't adhere to one dogma or the other. So you were raw vegan for a while, mm -hmm. right? A year for a year, and you were vegan a little bit, just normal vegan before that, right? Nope. Okay, so you were vegan after that for a little bit. I was just vegan for one year. Okay, vegan meat. for one year. Yeah, and then. A few friends introduced the importance of organ meats and eating nose to tail. So then you've been doing that for the last two and a half years. And here mm -hmm. you are now switching to this. Yeah. So you've experimented with all different types of diets and you at different con contextual points in your life saw the benefit at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I went off meat to be a vegan because I was like, I don't want to contribute to animal suffering anymore. It feels wrong. If I can't hunt this meat myself and kill it and skin it and chop it up, I shouldn't be eating it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just, for spiritual reasons, went off meat. But after a year of veganism, my hormones had crashed. My testosterone levels were like in the 200s. I didn't feel good, really, really bad um, uh, thyroid levels, cholesterol levels. So it was clear to me that I was missing the saturated fat from animal products that gives really good hormone health. So I, I started learning more about the health of organ meats and, and that meat is actually the most nutrient dense, bioavailable food, and all that's still true. But here's the difference that I've learned from following the Jesus diet is this fact you brought up about converting chi to energy and that we need to eat food with chi in it. So he even says like, don't cook your food. Don't like eat raw fruits and vegetables 
don't eat that which has been submitted to the fire, he says, for the fire is, is the element that kills mm. to regenerate life back into the earth, right? It's the decomposer of life. So don't cook your food in it, which makes sense. But um, what came back full circle for me was that although meat is the most nutrient-dense, bioavailable form of food, I think it is very good for the physical body. But the nuance here is that what's good for the physical body may not necessarily be good for the spiritual body mm -hmm. and your frequency. Because I look more at food now as the difference, the ratio of matter to water in that meat is much less water in it than like fruit does. Fruit is like 95% like water or something. And meat is like 70% water. And I, as a meat eater, can sit here and nod my head and yeah. say, absolutely, that makes sense, especially because we are comprised of so much water. It's, I think m our molecular composition is over 99% water. So mm -hmm. you're wanting, I, I think it makes sense to eat something like supports like that is very water dense. Yeah. Water dense material. Because water is the medium that really transfers mm -hmm. energy and, and chi yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So looking at nutrition like that really changes the game because you realize why, you know, the yogis of India, Tibetan Buddhists, like so many esoteric wisdom cultures don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. And I've, it always bothered me for the last two and a half years because I'm like, God, please show me what's up with this problem because I know there's a lot of truth to not eating meat, but like I tried that and it devastated my body. Yeah. And, I and it devastates a lot of people it too. Does. That's the thing. People lose teeth. I've known people that have yeah. lost teeth from veganism. Yep. And every, every single vegan friend I personally have had has had to abandon the diet due to nutrient deficiency. Mm. There's just minerals you're not getting, amino acids you're not getting, so many important things. So I'm like, God, why, if you don't want us to eat meat, why did you make meat the healthiest substance and you know, all this stuff? And I started to realize that it's about our frequency level because even in the law of one, Ra will explain that we have a chemical vehicle, which is like the physical suit, and then an energetic vehicle, a light body inside of that. And it's the eating foods with high electromagnetic energy in them that feeds the spiritual body and the nutrients and the denser forms feed the chemical body. So what's good for the physical body may not be good for the spiritual body, right? The physical body is following the spiritual body, evolutionarily speaking, mm -hmm. body, mind, spirit. So it's trying to play catch up to where the spirit's at and the spirit just needs pure light, right? And Ra says that extraterrestrial beings in the universe don't eat organic hard matter. They condense light into energy. They just live off of the sunlight, mm -hmm. right? And so that makes a lot of sense that as we evolve more and more toward light bodies, over the next thousands and millions of years, that what we eat will become subtler and subtler and less dense. And if you think about density, like we walk through gas and atmosphere right now, nitrogen, oxygen, mm -hmm. we don't even see it or notice it. We walk right, right through it and we breathe it, right? Imagine like a being that was, you know, a million tons per cubic centimeter in density. It would walk through us like we walk through atmosphere. It would That's not even so true. It would not even notice us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's way in a, a denser level of energy. Right. And so if energy is about frequency, then it makes sense that if you stop eating food and you go on like a seven-day fast or a 21-day water fast, your body is not getting its energy from food anymore. And so the body being hyper intelligent and adaptable says, I need a new way to convert chi into energy or ATP. And I have direct experience of that, dude. Yep. Like, And what you're saying is so true. I stopped feeling hungry a few days into my fast and I felt nourished, right? Yep. Just by breathing deeply doing qigong or just by standing bare feet on bare earth, looking at the sun, mm -hmm. like that felt nourishing. It's very blissful. Yeah. And you just feel tapped in on oh another level. Oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. So what's happening there? It's like your body saying, I need to convert ATP in a new way. And it, we know that your body converts sunlight already mm -hmm. into ATP and water. And when you ground on the earth and you get trillions of electrons donated to your body, mm -hmm. your body's already converting energy like that. But when you take away the food sources, it says, well, now I only have these four outlets of sunlight, water, grounding, and breathing. And so your body starts to raise your vibration to a higher a subtler level, less dense level, totally. to where it can take in more sunlight as prana, more water, more air, more earth, and transmute energy just through those sources alone. So this is why when you fast, the demons come out because your body has to raise your vibrational frequency to condense energy like that. And so all the lower energies in you, 
your depression, your traumas, your unhealed stuff will start to come out because your body has to get it out to raise your frequency. So fasting is a spiritual discipline purely from the science of how your body needs to convert energy when you don't eat. You just summarized my fasting episode in two minutes. So if you have not listened to episode 75, no need to. Just Nice. Just, well, I'd still listen to it because it was really good. But that's essentially it right there. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. Especially because for lack of a better term, I don't think it's turned off, but for lack of a better term, digestion is turned off. So yeah. your body then has an abundance of energy to turn towards something else. Mm -hmm. And so that's then kicking on its ability to, to receive more sunlight and things like this, as you say, because it can divert its attention elsewhere to receive nourishment. Yes. Because the energy that you're getting from pure sunlight or water or air, when you breathe in the air, doing breath work, it's so much subtler than the energy you're getting from meat totally. or even fruit or vegetables. Mm. So like, I fully believe that we as humans can live without any food, just on water and the elements, but you have to have a very high frequency for that, right? You can't be living a life of degeneracy and debauchery right. and expect to not eat food. You need, if you're a dense vibration, you need to eat dense things. Mm. So like those people who are partying and stuff, they need to eat meat and food like that. But if you raise your frequency to a certain level, your body becomes way more efficient at pulling in sunlight, prana from all these elements, the four angels of earth, right? And you can live off of that. And breatharians do that already. Um, they've proven that that's possible. Yoga, yogis of India have done this for thousands of years where you'll meet yogis that don't eat food. Um, I remember Yogananda's book, um, Autobiography of a Yogi. He talks about meeting a yogi who never ate food. And he followed him around and was like, yeah, the guy never eats. Right. Well, I mean, I freaking hung out with Rodney. He barely ate. The dude True. barely ate any food. Yeah. I mean, and then I also interviewed Jazz Maheen, who uh, claims to be a breatharian. And I absolutely believe that she is. Mm -hmm. I had a client once when I was coaching years ago who, was, uh, who had just gone to a breatharian retreat where they teach you how to do it all. And then you start your fast and stuff. And I think she was like, I think it was three months breatharian by the time we were doing sessions. And I was fascinated by it. I was like, tell me more. I had never heard of breatharianism. Um, so yeah, I've met somebody as well who's, who's done that. But nevertheless, to get back on to this topic, Jesus teaches this principle by saying, don't eat foods that are dead because there's no life force energy in them. Yes, they may give your body nutrients, but what you really want is the essence of life, the stream mm -hmm. of life to go into your spirit. That's what gives you happiness and joy and love and makes life worth living. So don't eat foods from far away. Don't eat to fullness, Jesus says. Never eat to fullness. Uh, he says, when you eat, don't uh, gorge yourself like the gluttons do when they shovel their food in their face. Never eat unless you're hungry. So don't eat to cope. Don't eat for pleasure. Only eat when your body needs nourishment. Um, he, this one I liked. This is very Ayurvedic. Don't mix too many foods together. Eat only two to three things at a time. And Ayurveda teaches that of food mixing creates digestive problems. Could totally see that too. Dude, so much people's digestion issues of digestion issues are just mixing too many foods together. I could totally see that. Because like your body has to release different enzymes to break down right. foods and some of them kind of compete with each other. Well, especially like on an Ayurvedic or traditional Chinese medicine perspective, it's like this one is of heat. This one right. is of, you know, bitter. This one is of this. And it's yes. like throwing all those in at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're supposed to stick to only cooling foods or mm. eating foods at one time. So Jesus backs that up. Uh, this one I like eat only two times a day, um, either breakfast and lunch or lunch and dinner. So basically, Jesus says intermittent fast every day, uh, and then every Sabbath do a twenty-four hour fast, a full day of not eating. Um, this one to me, this is the single hardest part of the Jesus diet. That's just what I call it. Um, that I've I've been following this to the letter: intermittent fasting every day, twenty-four hour fast, not mixing too many foods. This is the hardest one, bro. Jesus says, uh, when you eat your food, chew it slowly and mindfully and breathe deeply, you know, between uh, bites. Don't eat quickly, but chew your food basically until it's liquid before you swallow it. And I read somewhere online that um, you're supposed to chew your food 30 times. And it's the hardest thing. Like if you guys are listening and want to try this with your next meal, try to chew your food 30 times before you swallow it. Maybe it's just me, dude, but I would get to like 25 chews and like, you know, when you chew food, it goes to the back of your throat gradually. So you, as you're chewing food up here in your mandible, you've got a chunk of food back here that's like, swallow me, swallow me. 
and you have this urge that arises to swallow the food. Yeah. And it's irresistible, man. Right. And I'm like, I can't do it. You're right. I cannot chew 30 times. We taught this, uh, Dr. Edith and I, in our six-week super wellness course that we taught, and we had a mindful eating class, and we did the same thing. Oh, wow. And it really is hard. It's hard to chew your food that much, no matter you're, what you're eating, no matter no what. Matter you're what. Because you've yeah. trained the impulse of the, the gluttonous ego mind mm. is like, pleasure, yeah, swallow. <laughs> and you haven't really chewed the food right, yet. Right, right. Um, so the, getting over that habit was tough. Yeah. It has been an ongoing challenge. But Do I, you notice I, that you have to eat less, though, when you really sit and chew your food? Way less, dude. Right. Well, I, probably a third less. Yeah. I get full from a shockingly small amount of food now. Right, right. Um, so that one is, the, to me, the, the most difficult of all. Eat no flesh of animals. For what God has made alive, let no man kill. Um, don't eat foods cooked in fire. We talked about that because fire kills the life force in things. Um, so Jesus gives certain foods to eat that are good. He says fruits, vegetables, herbs, nuts and seeds, milk and honey. And he gives, he gives three criteria for how you can know food that God intended you to eat. And one of the criteria is that it will be something that's in abundance naturally. So um, fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, herbs, super abundant. But he, he names milk in that category. And he, he mentions milk a lot, actually, more than any other food mm. and says that milk is good for man's eating. And he says, actually, any milk from any animal is good for man and that God intended animals to have an abundance of milk for man to eat. This is interesting because Molly Englehart Again, friend of mine, regenerative farmer, um, as she was transitioning from vegan to vegetarian for her, she's uh -huh. she's still vegetarian just because she personally is grossed out by meat. But she also says this idea that regenerative or eating a vegan diet preserves the life of animals is is not correct. But totally that's setting that aside, yeah. Um, what she says is that like when vegans say to me that we shouldn't be milking cows, they don't know what the hell they're talking about because yeah. there is so. Even when my cow has just had a baby, there is so much milk available, way more than that baby could drink, yes. and it will go to waste. And it's nutrient dense. It's healthy for us. Why wouldn't we drink it? It's like it's screaming at us to drink it. Right. You know, it's how much more obvious could God have made it? Exactly. This calf needs this much milk, but the cow makes this much milk. Right. You know, and same with eggs. Yeah. So Jesus doesn't name eggs. Uh, or fish, but I think that they both fall under the category. Why would fish fall under the category? So fish, so there's actually two passages in the New Testament where it, it quotes Jesus as eating fish, or so he multiplies the fish twice. He helps his disciples catch a huge net of fish. Right. Um, I when remember he that. meets them. Yep. And in the, do you remember the doubting Thomas scene at the end of the Gospels where Thomas doubts if it's really yes. Jesus or not? Yes. Famous story. And it says, then after what that- you appro He's appro approaching on a boat, right? If I remember correctly. Um, it says he walks through the wall. Walks through, okay. Okay, yeah. right. And he shows, he's like, look at the hands, look at the holes in my hands, you know. But it says, after that, they broke bread and gave Jesus uh, fish to eat. And mm -hmm. they ate loaves and fish together. And it says that Jesus ate the fish. So that's another piece of evidence that Jesus was cool with fish. Um, fish are super abundant in nature. And Jesus says, eat, no flesh of beasts that walk upon the land. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of specific about like land animals are not okay. meant for man to eat. Mm -hmm. So that makes me wonder if fish are okay. And then you okay. have those passages in the Bible. Yeah. So I just put fish as like possible, mm -hmm. but um, eggs fall into the category of it's alive when you eat it. It's not dead. It hasn't been cooked in fire and it's in abundance in nature. Triple check, right? Yeah. So, so you're my, only eating them raw when you eat the eggs? I'll cook them sometimes, yeah. like very lightly, mm -hmm. um, but mostly raw, mostly, mostly raw shakes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, my theory was this, man. I'm like, okay, so I know that going off of meat, all animal products crushed my hormone levels. Mm. And I've seen plenty of my friends that did that to them as well. But we know eggs are like the most complete food, full amino acid profile, full nutrient profile, and lots of good saturated fats. I bet you I could have the same level of healthy hormones I have now eating eggs and raw milk every day. So when I started this diet, my diet's basically, I try to get a thousand milliliters of raw milk a day. Oh my God. Which isn't that much. That's, I mean, me. relative to what I drink, I'm just thinking of like what I drink of raw milk. That's, yeah. I mean, that's it's like still... two solid glasses of milk. Yeah. You know? um, Jesus talks a lot about honey being really good. Mm -hmm. And we know honey is just like a super high vibrational food. B12 
bees are like the most magical insects on earth and have tons of crazy metaphysical properties. So I think honey is one of the best foods for humans to eat on a spiritual level. But um, raw milk, thousand milliliters a day. I do six or more raw eggs a day. Um, I try to do two tablespoons of raw honey that I get from the farmer's market. And then just fruits and vegetables. I'll eat some nuts every now and then. But, what fruits um, and vegetables are you eating? Blueberries is my number one. Mm -hmm. I love blueberries. Is there a reason for that or you just like them? Blueberries are just especially high in antioxidants in the fruit category, and they're really good for cognitive health, for brain mm -hmm. health. So fruit, uh, sorry, blueberries, strawberries, uh, bananas, apples, and then Jesus talks about figs a lot, so I love dates. Oh, dude, I Nature's love candy. Can, is butter still okay? Raw yeah, butter? from from milk. Have you ever Butters. had dates and butter as a snack? No. I think I, I told you about that before. No, I don't bro. know. Okay, you should try that. Dates and butter. That sounds heavenly. Dude, it's the best. Dates and butter and honey. Oh my God. Even <laughs> and better. Wash it down with milk. Oh, dude, oh my God. See, like, there's so many delicious foods in this diet <laughs> yeah. that, like, I'm loving my diet more than I ever have. Really? And How's your digestion been with it? Perfect. Energy levels? Because I'm fasting every day and yeah. then a 24 hour fast. And then I also do, because Jesus teaches them how to do an enema in the Essene Gospel of Peace. And I've only done like two or three enemas in my whole life mm -hmm. up until this point, but just reading up on the health benefits of them, they're You've been doing coffee enemas or water enemas? Green coffee. Coffee, yeah, that's the best way to do it. They're just so good for you, mm -hmm. so good for your gut. And so I was like, I'll do an enema when I fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our friend Otto does one every day yep. and swears by them for his health. And uh, so doing that, bro, like my gut is on another level now. It just mm -hmm. feels so healthy. My digestion's perfect. No bloating at all. Like it, this diet that Jesus lays out was the, an answer to my prayer Yeah. because I've been, again, asking God, like, I don't want to eat meat if I don't have to, if there's a way not to, I'd rather not. It doesn't feel congruous with my soul, but like, it's so healthy for my body. Right. And so then boom, Jesus, uh, God wakes me up in the middle of the night to read the Jesus diet from the Essene gospel. And it resonated like nothing in my life has, man. I can't explain it. And I just knew like, this is the diet to follow. Yeah. And since I've been doing it, it has proven itself to be the perfect diet for me. I mean, it's, it really is incredible, especially because it brings in raw milk and eggs, but more important than that, because I would imagine in terms of the, I guess you could say dense forms of nutrition that mm -hmm. helps aid the nutritional deficiencies that you may have had on a vegan diet for sure. Yep. But more important to me is the emphasis on earth sunlight yes fasting and breath and mm -hmm. water in water those five yeah. things like that that right there is like oh my gosh this is pointing at something that is true especially because why it resonates with me so deeply and why i wanted to interview you on this is because of my experience fasting which changed my life yeah it changed mine too bro yeah. your experience really oh wow. yeah yeah i mean it was it was incredible man and then meeting other people who've done fast longer than i have and my friend Mike Cardamone is going to want to listen to this one because he's kind of the one who's experimented with a bunch of different fasts, uh, did like a 30-day only Concord grape fast or something oh, like yeah. that, a bunch of Talk different ones, him. yeah. And he he has the same perception with respect to density and the karmic implications of eating meat and that eating food weighs us down in this lifetime. and. Yeah. He wants to get to the point where he doesn't need any food at all and you just get nourishment from other sources. And mm -hmm. I think this is sort of pointing in that direction. How long do you think you'll do it? I mean, to me, it's, it's my new diet for yeah. life, but um, I'm going to get my bloods done in about a month and see where all my hormones are and everything. Um, I have a feeling that the fasting, all the different elements, just the mindful eating, less calories, like a, it's a very calorie restricted diet, which we know is like the number one correlation to longevity. Mm -hmm. uh, with the more calories you eat, the smaller your ribosomes, or I think the bigger your ribosomes become in your cells. And they've done a, a lot of research into like ribosomes and cells as a the direct correlator to how fast you age. Mm. And so a smaller ribosome means a slower aging process in the body. So like if you look at a, a professional bodybuilder's cellular ribosomes they're gigantic because they're eating 5000 calories a day it's just so unhealthy for the body to eat that much food it's so dense and slows the body down so much and you know everyone's afraid to fast for long periods of time you're going to lose muscle mass all the fears and there's some maybe some truth to that but like not to what i thought it would be though man i think if you get to right it's not what we thought no. first of all but i also think if your frequency gets to a certain level where you can synergize sunlight, water, earth, prana from the air fast enough, 
you won't lose any muscle mass. Yeah, I, just I, I have totally no body think fat. so. I mean, I don't want to quote James, but I think it's one of James Benefico's friends, James, a mutual friend of ours. Shout out to James for sponsoring this yeah, podcast, yeah. by the way. Um, but he, I think, ref- talked about how one of his friends cycles on 48-hour fasts with a really, really, really intense workout and that he's like reached multiple PRs in his workouts by doing it that way, by doing 48 hour fast followed by a really intense workout, 48 hour fast. I don't know how much he cycles those on and off and I could be misquoting James and it might not have come from James. I know I heard it from someone and I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Cycling them on that way because I think your body becomes so efficient at producing energy and receiving nourishment from other sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing I've noticed on my 24 hour fasts has been that every single time I fast the on Sundays, by the evening time, my Kundalini is going nuts wow. in my spine. Last night was the worst it's ever been. Worst or best? Best in a, in a bad way. <laughs> good, in, bad in a good way. <laughs> it's, it's just so intense. Bro. I get what you mean. Yeah. That's have why you, I asked. Have you experienced way. that like yes. crazy buildup of energy? I had... Um, my first, I call it the inner conjunction when the Kundalini rises up the spine, the lightning bolt event, everybody considers that event, a Kundalini awakening, Mm -hmm. but actually a Kundalini awakening is a very long process. It's a metaphysical upgrade of your nervous system from a third density frequency to a fourth density frequency. So that's an inner purification process. Kundalini kicks out all the the demons that you're, you're holding and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. So it's a very long process, but Within that process, usually at one point or usually multiple points comes this inner conjunction where Kundalini charges so much that it has to discharge through the crown chakra. And that's when you have the lightning bolt event. So I've had two of those. I know, I know very well what they feel like. Okay. And every single time I fast by evening time, I'm like sitting on the couch writing or doing some work. And I start to feel that buildup of Kundalini in the base of the spine. It starts to get really uncomfortable and I'm like writhing around and then the heat comes in after that and it starts to feel like, like a hot frying pan type of heat in my spine. And then after that comes the tingly staticky feelings and it starts to rise higher and I'm like, I'm about to blast off while I'm trying to do an email. Like I got to put my computer away. So eventually I'm forced to stop what I'm doing and go lay down and do breath work and try to move the energy. Yeah. So it's like that shows you that when you stop eating food, your body, especially the more spiritually enlightened you are, the faster your body goes into this state of transmuting prana through uh, subtler forces, right? Mm -hmm. And your frequency starts to rise, which is why Kundalini gets active. So I'm really excited to try like a three or seven day water fast Mm -hmm. and just kind of see what happens. Dude, you might not be here anymore. You might just- (laughs) I'll be like Enoch. (laughs) I'll be taken back to heaven. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but what you're describing with the, the Kundalini, this, you call it a conjunction point inner conjunction, inner yeah. conjunction. I, I think I had shared that dream with you is it relates to the law of one when I had that really profound dream. And then I had the Kundalini rising experience. That's what I call it. Mm-hmm. Conjunction experience. I woke up and I was like vibrating in my bed from head to toe afterwards. And it was so intense yeah. that it kind of freaked me out a little bit. I mean, doesn't that show you how much energy we have in our body? All right. Like we have so much, we have so much energy in our cells. And in fact, in the, uh, the I am discourses of St. Germain, there's two sessions where Jesus becomes the channel rather than St. Germain. And in the, one of the sessions, I believe it's either nine or 15, um, Jesus talks about the energy hidden within the atoms of our cells. And Jesus says, the more that you come in touch with the I am principle, which is what Jesus very much spoke from, right? In the gospels you you unleash the atomic energy hidden within the atom and your vibration increases more energy expands and we know that every chakra is its own torus field around the body so every new chakra you activate creates that torus field of that chakra which stretches wider and wider so you have the red ray orange ray yellow ray green ray blue ray indigo ray and then violet ray and so higher density beings for example can look at somebody and see their energy field, see their aura, and know exactly how ascended they are based on the color spectrum that they, the readout of their color mm-hmm. spectrum. So we have this energy in our cells that's not, it's dormant. We haven't let it unleashed because right. we're in a lower vibration. We're suffering. We have a strong ego. We're in those lower frequencies. And so I love the Essene path 
the sevenfold path of peace that's all about extreme discipline in the body. And this is something that the Hatha yogis share as well of, of India. Hatha yoga is like this extremely strict physical disciplinary yoga tradition where they eat extremely clean, very few calories, lots of long fasting, and they do these crazy difficult yoga postures and bandhas and locks, and they spend all day doing these strengthening positions and they clean out their nasal passageways with string and they do nasal flushes and enemas and it's like ultimate physical purity. And other yogis look at them and kind of look down their nose a bit being like, what are these fools doing wasting their time, all this body purification? Don't you know the self is not the body? You know, realize the self, don't waste time on your body. But the Hatha yogis know that the body is directly linked to the mind, the mind is directly linked to the spirit, they're each like the activating agent of one another. Mm -hmm. So the body is the activating agent for the mind and the mind for the spirit. So if you have an unhealthy, toxic body, you can't realize the self. It's impossible. It makes total sense. You cannot conquer the mind if you have not first conquered the body. God gave us this three-dimensional self to give us like, you know, you go to first grade and then you go to second grade and then third grade. In the same way, like start with your body. If you cannot live a physically healthy, disciplined life where you're eating healthy food, you're not addicted to toxic food anymore, you're exercising, you know, you have a healthy body. Dude, if you can't master your physical body like that, you got no shot at mastering your mind. 100%. Your, Especially your because like when we, when we look at something like German New Medicine too, and this speaks of mental health as well, mental emotional health, um, that the the physical symptoms that arise within us are in many ways a product of the mind and where mm -hmm. we are misaligned mentally. So if you do have a physically unhealthy body, the likelihood that you've mastered any aspect of your mind or spirit at that level is very, very low in my opinion. I don't think it's possible right? because the toxins that your body accumulates, it creates entropy in your body. You know what I mean? It's more for your body to deal with, which stirs the mind up. Mm -hmm. So a healthy body leads to a quiet mind, right? Right. And a quiet mind leads to spiritual realization. So the Essenes figured that out for sure because they taught such a strict discipline of physical health. And Jesus says in the Essene gospel, he who, he who, creates, a health, he who creates health in his body has built a temple for the Lord to come and dwell in him. Mm. And that's a, a Bible verse too. The body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, so much of spirituality kind of ignores the physical body. And a lot of- It's all of about it, transcending the physical yeah. body. I'm like, no, nah, I just don't jive with that, man. I mean, transcending maybe if you're talking about mastering, right? but not ignoring and leaving behind that's, the And body. that's the context that a lot of people yeah. subtly take it as. Oh yeah, non-duality. the leaving behind the body. And it's like, no, 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 no. I, I want to master this body. It's like, I'm not the body, I'm not the body. Well, you're not eternally the body, right. but you are temporarily the body. Absolutely. The body is an expression of who you are right now, and you can't escape it. Mm -hmm. You'll never escape being a body in this incarnation. You're meant to merge the body with the spirit, make them one, like the Essene tree of life, earth and heaven meeting in you in the center of the tree. That's true transcendence, right? Mm -hmm. Not a dismissal or a denial of the body. Yeah. So like the Buddhists, like the Hatha yogis, the Essenes prioritized physical purification before mental purification, meaning don't even try to master your mind if you can't even master your eating habits yet. Because it's a correlation, right? Yeah. Your undisciplined eating habits, your messy room, all these things are symbols of your messy mind. <laughs> it's the same patterns, right? I'm laughing because Kylie, I don't, I don't want to say she gets frustrated. We have two kids. We have a six-year-old and a three-year-old, but I am so almost like OCD obsessive about our house being clean. Mm -hmm. And if I see a mess anywhere, I have to go immediately to clean it just because I cannot have clutter mm -hmm. in my surrounding area. I have to have it be clean. I'm with you. Yeah, That's a sign of uh, a purified mind. There's a pattern you've built of, I see something that's awry. I see a mess. I deal with it right now. Yeah. I don't put it off till later. If you're putting away everything where it goes in your physical house, you'll naturally do the same thing with your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. You'll naturally watch your thoughts and go, oh, that was an unloving thought. Let me forgive that. Let me put that away where it belongs. I forgive you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's tidiness of mind. It's the same principle. Yeah. Do you, so with your workouts that you've been doing, because you're a very physically fit guy, how, how have your workouts been since following this diet? Great. Still PRing. 
Awesome. Um, still, still getting stronger. So, so far the theory seems to pan out that you don't need to eat meat to have muscle mass, be strong, have good hormones. Um, I won't know for sure till I get my bloods done, but I can't wait for you to get your blood done. Cause I want to know. And it's, it's yeah. funny cause the next episode I'm interviewing Brian Sanders who went and lived with the Hadza people in Africa and uh-huh. hunted with them. And I love hearing these, these different approaches, but this resonates with me so much, so much because I do a- admittedly being a meat eater myself, as you have been, mm-hmm. have struggled with like, okay, on one hand, I understand that regenerative agriculture in its current context, where we're all not growing food on our own, does not lead to the preservation of life and animals. And it's also the understanding that when we read something like The Secret Life of Plants, there is, uh, plants are imbued with a certain level of sentience as well, right? But at the same time, when I look at a plant versus looking at my dog as an example, I recognize the sentience in my dog versus the plant much more. And that's just Mm -hmm. the reality of how we are. And I could not, I could reconcile killing my plant much more than I could reconcile killing my dog. There's just no way I could reconcile that. So that's on one hand of things. And then the other is like, at the same time, I look at uh, eating meat and I've always thought, even through eating meat, that there are some karmic implications that I have to reconcile and that's why I've really made an effort to yeah. pray over my meat and only source it from places that I know they're raising them well, eating, you know, only grass fed, grass finished beef. But I still, even so it's like, ah, oh, there's gotta be some more karmic implications here. Mm-hmm. So I've been sort of wrestling with that in my mind. And then I talks on food dense, like the, the density of nutrients and, and you know, how there's an agenda at play, it seems to mm-hmm. get people to stop eating meat. And I'm just like wrestling with all these thoughts in my mind on what is the correct approach. And I really like this because it doesn't cast aside all animal products. It's just the ones that take life of animals, right? And that's where raw milk and eggs, I love raw milk and eggs. So if I could continue eating those, cool. I'm cool. Totally. That's exactly how I feel. And I wouldn't tell everybody listening, like you should stop eating meat. No, like meat is really healthy for people. And it's all about where you're at in your spiritual walk. I would say, um, like for my parents, like I highly encouraged them to start eating grass fed, grass finished steak and meat because they were, they had a very nutrient deficient diet and we're eating like breads and stuff and nothing really that healthy. So I'm like, eat a meat centered diet. Cause I know that that works for physical health, but that's only going to carry you up to a certain point. And maybe that can help you master your physical health, right? You can rely on meat and organs as a staple of your diet to get a really healthy physical body but you're not going to really ascend your frequency spiritually. If you're eating meat Mm -hmm. at some point, you'll have to go beyond that density to a a subtler density of just fruits, vegetables, water, et cetera, honey. And that will allow raw milk and raw milk. Most important. Can't forget it. Uh, that will help your frequency rise. Mm -hmm. So the prescription I would give anybody is if you haven't fully mastered your physical health now, which to me would mean I have no struggle at all with my diet. You know, I I have no problem fat. I fast regularly. I'm physically healthy and fit. I exercise. This is normal to me. It's not a discipline or a challenge. I enjoy eating healthy. That's mastery to me. Mm -hmm. Get to that point first before you consider jumping to like the Jesus diet, because you're going to need, if you're at a denser level of frequency, you know, you're really struggling with traumas you're trying to heal. Like it may be too much for you to start fasting all the time. Mm -hmm. It may bring that stuff up too quickly, too intensely. Totally so slower, I talked about that on my fasting episode too. For yeah, some people, it's not right. Yeah, it's a slower journey can be better for mm-hmm. some people. But eventually, you'll feel a natural pull of like, yeah, I think my time of eating meat is coming to a close and I'm ready to go to the next level. And very much like your friend, bro, I, I have a feeling that I'm going to go at some point totally off of food mm-hmm. and just try to live on with the angels of the earthly mother Dude, if alone. you can be as big as you are now, I, know, we'll I, see. I, I can't wait to see that. I wouldn't even mind losing some muscle mass, right? Like yeah. it wouldn't bother me. How much do you weigh right now? Cause you're the same height as me. We're like six, one and three, four, six, two. Yeah. Yeah. How, how much um, do you weigh? This morning after a 24 hour fast, I weighed 201. Uh-huh. Most days I'll be like 204, 205. What percent body fat? No idea. No, I mean, dude, you're, he's, he's shredded. Okay. Everyone watching on camera, you can probably relatively tell. lean. Yeah. But the, the fasting gets you really lean, man. Yeah. Oh my God, dude, I, on my 
17 day I lost 27 pounds or something like that. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, yeah, I you looked like a different man. I did. It was it was nuts. And then my skin was also glowing like crazy, which also It was. And too. I was going to say you I told James this actually. I was like, "Alec looks so healthy." Thanks, man. His skin is like glowing, <laughs> like he's got light behind his eyes. Like you looked totally transformed. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Man, this is such a fun conversation. I could talk to you about everything. We could talk for hours and hours and for hours. Sure. I mean, you're uh, one of my best friends, man. So love Likewise, chatting man. with you. Um, and it's so rad that we get to live by each other and yeah. hang out all the time. So um, where can people find more about you and your work and share a little bit about 4 du Yeah, so um, I'm the same everywhere. It's just Aaron Abke, whether you're looking on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, my website. Um, Aaron Abke is where you'll find me. My program is called 4D University, and you can learn more about that at 4D, number four, letter D, university.com. And uh, really, it's kind of an online academy that takes people through the process of a self-facilitated Kundalini awakening. Um, we do a yearly annual seven-day fast together in my program, which is really fun. But in the past, we've done juice fasts. And this year, I'm, we're going to do a seven-day water fast, nice. exactly as Jesus prescribes it. Oh, so they it. do say that in there, in the scene gospel. Jesus piece. gives people a seven-day water fast as the prescription to heal their sicknesses and get the demons out of them. He says, submit yourself to the angel of water for seven days and seven nights, bathe in the river, drink the water, do enemas with it, and the angel of water will purify you of all negative karma, basically. Wow. So we're going to do that in my program this year. I'm psyched about it. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in walking that path, um, 40 university is like an online academy designed to teach and walk the student through that Kundalini awakening process. And you can, uh, you can learn all about that on 40 university.com. Awesome. Love you, dude. Love you too, brother. Thanks for having me. So many of us dream of buying some land, growing our own food, and becoming self-sufficient away from a society that's gone completely mad. What if it's easier than we think to make that dream a reality? Siblings Jamie and Shelby over at Living the Off-Grid Dream have cracked the code to getting land and living a life of freedom. They'll show you where to find land for $1 down, that's right, $1 down, with low monthly payments as well as how to structure your vision for a homestead, retreat center, regenerative farm, or community. It's one thing to have food, water, and land security, but it's an entirely different thing to have the financial security to buy the land and build it out in a way that aligns with your goals and aspirations. Their program teaches you how to make enough money on your land to cover all of your costs to make that happen. Plus, they've got you covered with pre-filled out plans to give you inspiration if you're not quite sure what your best move for your land is. And if you're a member of The Way Forward, you get a free one-on-one -on -one strategy call with Jamie and Shelby as well as a free bonus gift. If you want to turn your homesteading, off-grid, or retreat center dreams into a reality, join Living the Off-Grid Dream by clicking the link in the show notes or heading to thewayforward.com forward slash off-grid. In nearly all cases with modern health systems, you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with a doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects. If this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the new biology clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story 
recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes, physically and metaphysically. Members of the New Biology Clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code the way forward for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of the way forward, email hello at the to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here.